Hey guys, welcome out to Revolution. We're going to be looking at the history of the Textus Receptus. And so um, some of you guys might enjoy this. Uh, this is what we're going to do is we're just going to go through uh, some of the main points of um, that pre-Reformation, the Reformation period and the post-Reformation period. Um, we're, we're pretty much going to go up to the Elzevas and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through um, some main points and we're going to look at some of the um, the key players like, you know, um, the Complutense and Polyglot translators, Erasmus, we're going to look at Stephanus, we're going to look at Theodore Beza and we're going to look at some of the um, lesser known um, uh, compilers of the Greek text and some of the polyglot editions and things like that. And so um, these uh, videos are set up so that anyone can join. I can have 10 um, people join this uh, this video. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, share this and that way people can join in. And so I'm just going to be uh, fiddling around a little bit, but while I'm fiddling around, I don't want to bore you guys. And so I will uh, continue to uh, chat. Okay, so here we go, share. Um, invite, here we go. So I'm going to put this up on the screen. If you want to jump into uh, this live uh, feed, uh, feel free. Just type that in, StreamYard. Um, it's a HTTPS, so it's got a secure thing there. Uh, StreamYard.com and then type that in. And you'll um, come up in my um, StreamYard uh, feed here and I can add you. And so uh, you can become another uh, bobbing head up here and you can stay as long as you want or as short as you want. Um, but other than that, you can comment. Uh, we're streaming live on uh, YouTube and uh, also on Facebook, on the Texas Receptus Academy and also on Twitter. And so on the Texas Receptus Academy, there's only about a thousand people on there, I'm pretty sure. Um, the Twitter, feed, my Twitter feed, I haven't really done much with that since um, probably 2019 when I had a Twitter war with James White. <laughs> James White seems to love Twitter because you can only reply, you know, in a certain amount of words. And so he seems to love to grab those tweets rather than, you know, read you in context and all the things that he, you know, would scold people for doing to him. Um, Okay, so we just got a comment from uh, Helge uh, Evanson. Hi there, brother. It's midnight exactly here in Norway. Um, I'm a night animal and looking forward to this live stream. <laughs> okay, great. Um, interesting to see you're in Norway there. Um, we're always interested in Texas receptors, Bibles, and so it'd be great to um, perhaps know where um, the TR Bibles are um, or what the TR Bibles are in, in Norway and what the situation is like there. Um, in some places, I actually have TR Bibles uh, as the mainstream Bible, um, which is which is quite good. But it, in most places, unfortunately, the um, Bible societies have been hijacked by uh, Unitarians and now by liberals. And unfortunately, they're, they're pushing their text. But... Um, I'm just going to start going through a bit of a theme. And so I'm going to start with um, a few um, a few issues that were before the printing um, of the Competency in Polyglot and Erasmus. And so we're going to be looking at a few characters, Lorenzo Valar, Aldous. Now, I recommend um, if people want to know about Aldous, watch this video here. And so I'll just get rid of the transcript there. How Aldous Minutius saved civilization with Scott Clemens. Now, Scott Clemens, he's obviously, he's not a Christian. He's just an academic guy. 
but um, he has quite a lot to say about Aldous and um, his scholarship, and it's it's worth a watch. Um, this is probably a good primer um, that will that will lead you on to the Aldous is probably one of the main players of that era um, for scholarship uh, for Greek learning and. His influence on Erasmus would have been huge. And so um, I highly recommend that. Um, okay, so there's my my rough notes popping up on the screen for everyone to see. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at is the fall of Constantinople. And so I thought, well, what better than just having wikipedia articles <laughs> you know um usually scholarship are like don't don't go to wikipedia you know i've i've heard that from people like usually people in university because the first thing they get taught is don't go to wikipedia because um you know wikipedia obviously can be edited by anyone <clears throat> um but i i find um, wikipedia is very good especially if you go to uh, so I'll just, you know, have a bit of a um, defense of, of Wikipedia and the reason why I do use some of the Wikipedia articles. Because you can go to the talk, um, you can you can check out um, major discussions that have happened um, with people trying to uh, put information in or links in or remove things and... Uh, there's debate wars and, you know, some people have a barrow to push. Some people might be from a, um, you know, Greek Orthodox background, Catholic background. They might be from a Muslim background. And so that they want to, they want things to uh, go in a certain direction and um, the article is not neutral enough and things like that. And so it's good to go through and especially if you're going to be a master at, at something. Um, and so, um, you know, there's the old saying, the jack of all trades, master of one. Now, here in Australia, nearly everyone just says jack of all trades, master of none. They don't even know that the master of one um, sort of parable. I'm pretty sure it was uh, was a, um, Ben Johnson. Anyway, um, and so it it's about being like having a good overall understanding of things but becoming a master of one. And so um, I encourage people to do this with their Bible study. Um, yes, re, you know, just constantly read through the Bible, read through the Old Testament, New Testament. I usually encourage people for their own spiritual edification to read the New Testament probably about 10 times more than they do the old because some people get stuck in the old and they get stuck in the concepts of the old and they tend to drag it into the new. And the old is, it's like chalk and cheese. The Old Testament is redundant now we've it's fulfilled in christ and so um you know reading through the levitical laws and things like that you, you're like well how does this relate to me and you have to sort of spiritualize everything you know so um for your own like you know when i'm talking to people who aren't really you know scholars or aren't, or aren't really uh, pursuing you know um history or or um you know text criticism or you know looking at um things like we're looking at today I just say to them, look, just read about 10 times more the New Testament as you do the old. And so, yes, read the old. It's great. Read Proverbs, Psalms, great. But, um, you know, sometimes people, are they're caught in, you know, Jeremiah somewhere. And it's like, look, I understand it's, it's, it's good. It's the word of God and we need to read it. But for your own spiritual benefit, there are detriments to, to reading through some of the old testament and applying that directly to your life because we have a much better covenant than david had than elijah had than any of those guys they look to what we have today having the temple in us god living in us that they look to that and went wow that's way superior and so we're actually looking at a, a redundant and an inferior covenant and so we've got to be careful um even theodore beza said that he said one of the, the main things that scholars need to do is make a distinction between the Old and New Testament. And so, um, but by being a, a jack of all trades and master of one, especially in the area of like the Texas Preceptors, you're looking at um, all the issues, but you're mastering on one. And like I said, with the, with the Bible, you might um, 
you might just get a book. And usually what I, I encourage people to do is get something easy at, at first. Don't, um, you know, be, become a master of, you know, the book of Luke. It's huge. You, know, you can do that if you're prepared to do that. And But, you know, just go to the book of James or something like that or Philemon or, you know, <laughs> I started with Second John because at, at the time I thought it was the, the shortest. Apparently Third John has less Greek words and so that's apparently the shortest. But, um and so I became a master of that, reading through that, looking at the Greek in that, looking up all the definitions in that, looking, reading every Bible version, reading that verse, you know, five, six times a day, or that chapter five, six times a day, and becoming a master of that. But then there's other things in the Bible I have no idea about. And so um, that's the amazing thing about the Bible is there's there's so much to know. And I guess when I say I've got no idea about I've got a cursory understanding of it. It's like, okay, I understand that's there. I really should look into that one day. Um, but usually um, I'm dealing with putting out fires. And so as I'm putting out fires, I tend to study those things in that way. Um, so when we come to this, uh, the fall of Constantinople is like a, a key moment in history. And what I tend to do as well is um, in my mind, I try to keep, key dates and key moments of history um so say the fall of constantinople this coincides with the printing press um that um you know uh, gutenberg's printing press when he um started printing with movable type and so the city of constantinople fell in 1453 so usually 1453 is like this is a ch this is like a, a, a BC AD moment for for the Byzantine era. So up until this moment, you had people living quite comfortably in Constantinople, um, you know, copying manuscripts, doing uh, you know religious things uh, there, and then you know basically the Ottomans, um, the Muslims, they came in and turned this city into Istanbul, which is in Turkey today. They turned the Hagia Sophia, uh, yeah, they, they turned the church into a mosque, uh, which you can go and visit today. It's interesting that they're actually um, building a replica in Pakistan. Um, and so uh, just near where um, they've got this new project called Blue World, it's interesting at the moment there, the CIA seem to be overthrowing Pakistan. Um, but uh, hopefully, um, hopefully Imran Khan will get back in very soon. Uh, he's, he's actually, a, for um, for what he is, he's actually a, a pretty good leader. Um, but I'm digressing. So the fall of Constantinople, this is a very important thing to understand. And so basically, um, this opened up, um, you know, 400 and I guess 50, 460 years of Ottoman rule in, in this area. And so uh, I guess you got to think of trade going through that area, all being, you know, cr Christian. When I say Christian, I'm talking about just the general use of the term Catholic. Uh, I don't like people um, putting the term Christian on genuine um, sorry, on non-genuine believers. Um, I, I'm always careful to um, to let people know that when I'm doing that because I've had, um, you know, Jewish uh, preachers, um, th these are Messianic Jews, tell me that because Hitler said he was a Christian and because Germany was a Christian country that um, all of Christianity was tainted, tainted by Nazism and we need to apologise for the Holocaust and all this sort of stuff. Christianity was a main force behind the Holocaust and it's like, look, just because you have these names, um, you, you can't demonise everyone. You can't just pigeonhole everyone as, oh, you, you know, they're all Christian and look, they're evil. And so, you know, you Christians now who live now and have nothing to do with that, you have to apologise. It's just ridiculous. And so we see a lot of that ridiculousness with the term Texas Receptus, which we're going to look at as well. Um, but I'll just quickly check. Uh, we've got some chat rolling in. Um, 
Okay, so Helge said uh, there is a Norwegian Bible translated from the King James Version 2003, which was sponsored by Burning Precious Seeds in the US. A friend of mine translated it in the late 1990s. It is good, but not perfect. Wow, that's really good. That's great to know. I'd, I'd love to put that one onto my website. That'd be really cool. Um, so Avery Chance, um, I was taught use Wikipedia as a secondary source, never primary. Yeah, and that's a good point. Um, I guess the old Wikipedia, um, read it in light of the new, read it in the light of the new. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's the thing. I mean, we usually, how I use Wikipedia is I go through, I read the whole thing and then I'll look at key issues. Like say, you know, if I'm teaching myself about Constantinople, if I came to, the fall of Constantinople and didn't know anything about it. Um, I might look at, you know, a list of sieges of Constantinople. There, there might have been, um, you know, it went on for quite quite a long time, 53-day siege, and so we can look at that. I actually watched a, a good movie on this. Um, I can't remember what it was called, but it was about Ahmed um, or Mehmed, sorry, Sultan Mehmed. And so it goes through, um, it's just a, um, a depiction. It's sort of like, you know, Hollywood um, style, but it's a series. And the more I watched it, the more understanding of I got of the desperation of that that time. And, and it was quite a good one to watch. And so, um, so you're basically the Ottomans. And so what's interesting as well is, um, you know, this date basically the area of the ottoman empire in especially in israel um it wasn't liberated until um the second world war and it's interesting that um i i sort of know quite a fair bit about that because there was 800 um light horsemen and a lot of them came from this area where i live and they fought uh, for the british obviously and um when uh, the Turks they had um, they had the advantage of machine gun um, weaponry, um, and so the light horsemen they had been in they had all their own horses, all the Australian horses and everything like that. They'd been in the desert for quite some time, and uh, apparently, like you, you read different stories and different accounts of how um, the you know the the brave you know australians just went in there and sort of overtook the ottoman empire and basically you know, overthrew um what had happened here in 1453 but actually it came out years later that um by by the you know first hand witnesses and things like that that some of the horses started actually just charging because they smelt water and they couldn't they couldn't hold the horses back <laughs> and so i guess you know some of these horses weren't used to a lot of war and things like that and so you know they they would be if they're thirsty they're going to run for water and you know um back on the old farm in australia it would have been a bit of fun um but these horses ran straight into the turk um stronghold and they couldn't actually wind their machine guns they, they had them um on a, a distance level but they couldn't wind them down quick enough to to shoot the horses coming in so fast and so they just overtook the camp all of a sudden and and surrendered and um that all the turks surrendered and so they basically liberated um palestine and that's where you get modern day israel today so um it's quite an interesting story if you look into that so that's the the flip side of that is you know the ottoman empire you know, they took over this whole region you know the, the whole region of the, the middle east there um and so this is uh a key moment constantinople fell uh, the Ottomans just took over this whole region. And so eventually, uh, later on, um, the Greeks would fight back in you know, a few civil wars here and there. A few other countries would fight back. But um, mostly uh, it, it remained um, Islamic and is still Islamic today. It's quite interesting. Um, you can see the walls there. Um, a lot of artwork. So this is just all on Wikipedia just going through that um, bit of warfare happening. So how does this fit into our story? Well, 
in Constantinople, they were uh, keeping records of biblical writings and also classical writings in Greek. And so a lot of the uh, Greek learning was there. And so we know the Romans um, in the ancient world, they sort of stole a lot of uh, the Greek writings and sort of adopted it to their own uh, for themselves. But we see that um, when Constantinople fell, um, the Greeks basically flooded Europe. And so uh, at one stage, um, when Erasmus was in Venice, there was rumoured to be uh, 5,000 Greeks living there as well. And so, which is very important for our story because we've got to understand that um, up until then, you know, basically it's um, Europe was Latinized. And so everything was Latin, the Bible was Latin. And, you know, communication, stories, books, all printed in Latin. And so then all of a sudden you've got Greek. And um, having these two witnesses is very important um, because when you when you can comparing different books, if you can read Latin fluently, if you can read Greek fluently, um, you can compare these. And comparing different languages, it, it really does help in, um, in the... Uh, compilation of texts and so um around about the same time oh so i'll just shut that down around about the same time um we have the printing press and so um so here's the big old um printing press here so what we find is um gutenberg so we've got a bit of a timeline down here um i might just enlarge in that a little bit Printing press in, they're saying 1440. So usually I say around the same time as um, the fall of Constantinople. And so um, I'm pretty sure that the Gutenberg Bible was in, um, yeah, the same year. Was it the same year? I usually say it's the same year, but it's, I guess it's something I've got to. So he went through like, you know, 10 or 15 year period where um if i type in gutenberg bible a little tell me printed it in the 1450s so yeah if i say 1453 it's like you know okay so basically about the same time you've got printing has just started and so um movable print so this is um you know the providence of god's obviously involved in this as well but um you know, he, you have all these Greek scholars flooding Europe. Then you have, um, you know, printing has just started. And so one of the things that, um, you know, obviously to print Latin it was the main thing and they did a copy of the Latin Vulgate, as you can see here in the picture. Um, but one of the things is it wasn't until about the 1570s that they started printing anything uh, with Greek in it. And, um, it was very hard to print uh, Greek because, you know, Greek has, you know, breathing marks. It has acute symbols. It has like the tilde type of things above letters and all sorts of different um, little jot, jots and tittles sort of, sort of thing above the Greek letters. And so it actually made it so if you were going to use a movable type, there was about a thousand different letters. And so... Um, that that hindered Greek being printed for quite some time. And so everything was just still handwritten. But then once um, people had nailed the, the printing of, of the Greek um, alphabet and, and you know, uh, being, being able to print Greek book, books, um, people like Aldous appeared on the scene. And so we're going to look at Aldous very soon, um, but I'll just shut that down and we'll just jump to... Um, an interesting guy called Lorenzo Valla. And so we'll look at Aldous. He's going to be the next guy up. But we'll look at Valla first. Um, and so Lorenzo Valla, uh, so he died in 1457, so around about the same time. You know, he just passed away. So he proved that the donation of Constantine was a forgery. So the donation of Constantine is a very interesting thing to look into. Uh, it's actually quite interesting for the defense of the Johannine comma because it has the comma in it. Um, the 
um, the donation of Constantine. And so proving that the Greeks would have believed that that was a genuine scripture because it was it was in there, it was mentioned in there. Now, uh, Lorenzo Valla, he proved that the donation of Constantine, which was basically the um, Constantine uh, donated um, his lands, basically, to the church. And um, so I'll just read it here. The donation of Constantine is a forged Roman imperial decree by which the 4th century emperor Constantine the Great uh, supposedly transferred authority over Rome and the western part of the Roman Empire to the Pope. Uh, composed probably in the 8th century, it was used especially in the 13th century in support of claims of political authority by the papacy. In many of the existing manuscripts, handwritten copies of the document, including the oldest one, the document bears the title uh, in Latin that says that. Uh, the donation of Constantine was included in the 9th century collection of pseudo da da da. So Lorenzo Valla, an Italian Catholic priest and Renaissance humanist, is credited for first exposing the forgery with solid philological arguments in 1439 and 1440, although the document's authenticity has been repeatedly um, contested since uh, 1001. So that's quite interesting. So Lorenzo Valla, uh, he was a very important person because yeah, he he proved this was a fake. And so um, th this uh, caused, uh, but basically, you know, the... the the Roman uh, church had been saying, well, or basically the Pope had been saying, we, we have, um, you know, this, all this permission from Constantine the Great to have all this land. And then it's been proven as a fake. So he sort of rocked the boat in a sense with the Roman Catholic church, but he was deeply embedded also in the Roman Catholic church, a bit like Erasmus himself, um, where he, you know, everyone knows the, the saying, you know, Luther um, laid the egg, uh, sorry, um, Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched. And so people said that, you know, Erasmus, he was just quietly going along and just you know, putting these eggs everywhere that eventually all these reformers just popped up and, and hatched these eggs. Uh, he was quite critical of the papacy. He was critical of the clergy and the popes. And you know, in some of his books, he was saying the popes had gone to hell and all this sort of stuff. It was quite flom. So Lorenzo Valla, he was quite influential on Erasmus. So obviously, he died quite a long time before Erasmus. I think it, we're probably looking at about 10 years before Erasmus was even born. Um, but what we see is, um, you know, Luther had a high opinion of, of Valla and his writings. Um, he was called, uh, called Luther's precursor, Erasmus. Uh, stated that for Latin grammar, there was no better guy than Lorenzo Valla. Um, on his textual criticism, um, so this is the main influence on Erasmus because um, Lorenzo Valla had pointed out where there was um, errors that had crept into the Latin Vulgate. So obviously with any manuscript to tradition, you have, um, you know, scribes, you know, they're, they're attempting to, um, to, you know, copy the text and, Obviously, there are corruptions that can creep into the text that are that are purposeful, but then there are just you know um, parablepsis, you know errors of sight or the way things are spelt, or you know in some regions they spell things differently, and so they they went through. Um, there wasn't you know, there wasn't a huge amount of dictionaries and things like that, and so uh, or you know standards of you know how things were, and so especially in some of these. Um, other languages like uh, like Latin, and you know, with the Latin, you, that's a translation, so things can be translated differently um, from the Greek, where the Greek was relatively you know, stable. It wasn't you know up to interpretation. It's like, well, that's the Greek word. That's how it should stay. You know, it might um, have gone like Greek. Obviously, went through um, different phases, just like English has. You know, English you know um, has gone through different phases where a word might have meant something, you know, 400 years ago. It doesn't mean the same thing today. And, you know, 800 years ago it meant something completely different. But, um, and so Greek went through those things. And sometimes that also crept into the text without trying to help people. Um, 
obviously if people didn't know what a word meant and they had to keep explaining it. it's like well let's just put that word in you know and so um so lorenzo valla a specialist in latin translation valla made numerous uh suggestions for improving uh the petrarch study of Livy, and so they go through a bunch of books that he um he was updating uh, in his critical study of the official Bible used by the Roman Catholic Church, Jerome's Latin Vulgate, uh, Valor called into question the church, church's system of penance and indulgences. He argued that the practice of penance rested on Jerome's use of the Latin word. Um, oh, I used to be able to say that. Um, penitentia, yeah, pen, yeah, and metanoia. Um, penance um, for, or metanoia, so it just means um, yeah, repentance, which he believed um, would have been more accurately translated as repentance. So they had do penance instead of uh, repentance. Valor's work was praised by later critics of the church, church's penance and indulgence system, including, or critics of the penance and indulgence system, including Erasmus. So Erasmus, you know, uh, there were obviously a lot of things that Erasmus uh, gleaned from Lorenzo Vella um, and, you know, the some of the critiques of the church um, were there as well. But uh, mostly it was to do with his um, annotations. So he wrote a whole bunch of annotations saying where the Latin needs to be amended. And so sometimes what they were doing was you would go through a comment, an old commentary. And what you find is the commentaries used to stay a little bit more stable than the text, because sometimes people would, would copy out a commentary. Um, but with the Bible text, they would use the one that they had there in front of them. And so um, sometimes what that proved was they would be writing things and things had dropped out of the biblical text but it was still in the commentary. And so that was that's why it was very important for people to continue to have commentaries with them and to look at, you know, um, old commentaries, even in different languages. And, and that's why it's important for us. You know, we see um, the, the crumbs of information still in commentaries. And uh, that's, that's why, like when I did my Revelation 16.5, uh, book looking at um, some of the old commentaries and how they had the one which Art and Weston shall be. Um, they had that in the commentary, but in the text they had Holy One. Um, this this showed to me that there was something that had changed there. So it was quite interesting. So anyway, um, Valor wrote a whole bunch of books and works, and so a lot of these are available. Um as far as going to study, um, uh, it doesn't really have much there. It might have more when we get to like Erasmus, but I'll, I'll just show you where you can go and have a good look at some stuff. Okay, so um, let's look at another guy who's, you know, we're sort of getting into the printing era here. So Aldus Minucius, and so... Um, he died in 1515. So this is just before, just after the Complutensian Polyglot was printed, but just before Erasmus had done his 1516 uh, Greek New Testament. Uh, Italian humanist. And so when we're saying humanist, obviously we're not talking about you know, uh, um, atheists, you know, hu uh, humanists of today. We're talking about people who are interested in the humanities, which are, you know, understanding um, the Latin understanding the Greek, understanding original language um, documents, but also understanding historical documents. And so basically these are the Renaissance humanists. So he's a scholar, educator, and the founder of the Aldean Press. It's very important to understand that because Erasmus worked at the Aldean Press. I'm pretty sure it was for eight months he worked there. Um, Minutius uh, devoted the latter part of his life to publishing and dissembling rare texts um, his interest in and preservation of Greek manuscripts mark him as an innovative publisher of his age, dedicated to the editions he produced. And so, um, you know, goes through a whole bunch of um, 
you know, in a lot of fields of, of um, understanding Aristotle, um, you know, different um, books, um, Euripides, um, different authors, they say that without Aldous, a lot of this information would have been lost. Because of the fall of Constantinople, Europe was flooded with, um, you know, a whole bunch of uh, Greeks bringing their manuscripts with them. And had Aldous not been there to print these and to work on these, um, that information just would have been lost. And some of the some of the stories are actually only halfway done, and um, and we wouldn't have had anything if it wasn't for Aldous. And so that's how important he is to um, to the modern era. And so, like that video I showed at the beginning, um, how Aldous saved civilization. Obviously, there's the book, you know, how the Irish saved civilization, or you know, then there's how the Scottish saved civilization. It's like, well, um, I think with that, uh, um, Aldous um, civilization would have been um, uh, damaged, you know, because uh, he was a main player and he was a huge influence on Erasmus. And so um, Erasmus ha had been using him as his main printer. And so I might actually just jump on my own website here because I do have a bit of, um, whoops, where am I? TR. Okay. So let's just check out Erasmus here. I'll just check out some of the comments. Um, so if anyone wants to join, uh, feel free. If you want to jump on and chat about these things, you might know quite a lot about um, some of what I'm saying and you, you want to bring that across, jump on board. Um, I'll just go to... Okay, all right, so we were there. Actually, before I go, <clears throat> before I go to Erasmus, I should really go to the Complutensian Polyglot. Actually, I'm still in, I'm still in Aldous here. So I think by reading through some of this, it'll give you a better picture. Now, this is on my website. So there are things that I've cleared up here. Um, so the influence of Aldous, so I'll just type in Aldous. Oops. Yeah, so I'll just read these little bits. Um, 1587, uh, Aldous, uh, sorry, Erasmus wrote to Aldous Minutius, the Venetian printer. At the time, the Aldous Press had become the most prominent printers in Europe and had already produced many Greek works. Erasmus requested that Aldous print his Latin translation of the two plays of Euripides. Um, so then we see 1508, Aldous republished Erasmus's Thousands of Proverbs, his Adigam. Um, and so we see in Venice, in December of 1507, Erasmus arrived in Venice um, in January 1508, in time to see the accomplishment of his Euripidean plays, uh, Erasmus rose to become one of the greatest Greek linguists of the entire Reformation era. He spent much of his time with Venetian printer Aldus Manetius um, and Ald Aldus's Greek Academy. So um, keep in mind these type of things because one of the things is when you're studying Erasmus, it's good to study those who are around him um it's it's very important uh his influences and also i've got a, a list of books that erasmus owned and it's quite interesting when you go through them and you think well he knew um yeah a lot of people try to make out as if erasmus is just you know um like themselves <laughs> just a um you know a bumbling fool who's you know, slipping on banana peels, who has really no idea about the Greek language or, you know, 
he's bumbling through the Latin and, you know, he's got all these biases and all the rest of it. And, but when you start going through the people who were around Erasmus, he was around the top scholars of the day. And um, he was always praised by those top scholars as the guy. And so, um, you know, the guy for Latin, the guy for Greek. So Aldous has had a Greek academy, which had within its core of Byzantine scholars. Um, he spent... Um, worded awkwardly there. He spent um, part of the time as a proofreader in the publishing house. So here he is proofreading Greek for uh, Aldous was known to be you know, very strict with how he printed books. Everything was had to be 100% accurate and here's Erasmus you know, proofreading for him. Um, the first publication of his Adagus or Ad Agus, so it's basically... Um, parables or or proverbs they're sayings like you know um uh i guess you know kill two birds with one stone and all that sort of stuff so this actually got translated later into english and it was quite influential in uh, the english language and it actually was very influential on shakespeare um and so erasmus had a huge influence on the whole of europe in in this era um, you know, Calvin, he um, he said that uh, Eras uh, it was Erasmus's influence and how he studied things that helped him to study the Word of God the way he did. Um, so we see here, uh, yeah, Erasmus stayed in Aldous's house for seven months. So that's a long time to spend with, you know, a prominent one of the world's most prominent Greek printers who has his own, you know, academy filled with Byzantine scholars who had fled Constantinople. That's a huge issue. That's a huge deal, I mean. And so, uh, you know, people make out that Erasmus, you know, he'd only just started learning Greek and he wouldn't have really known it and all this stuff. And so we're, we're going to debunk a few of those myths. Um, but firstly... We'll, we'll head to Erasmus in a minute. But what we're going to do, we're going to go to the Complutensian Polyglot Bible. And so Complutensian Polyglot Bible, this is a very important Bible to understand and know about because um, this was a, a work of um, pure scholarship. Now, we understand there was Catholic influence on this, and we understand also that with Erasmus, there's Roman Catholic influence. But the thing is, there's really nothing else. It's not like you can just walk down the street and join your local Protestant church. Now, we understand that Martin Luther had started his thing, and Erasmus, you know, he was saying good things about Luther in the beginning, and then he's saying, oh, you're a bit radical. And, you know, but the thing is, I mean, would you just join Luther's movement? You know what I mean? It's like it was, there were some things that Luther was doing that wasn't, you know, he, he got some things right, but there were a lot of things he got wrong. And so would you just join that? Or, you know, who would you join in that era? You know, so some people just felt safe for just going, well, let's just, let's see how this pans out. You know, some people, but like even Luther himself wanted to stay within the Roman Catholic Church and he wanted to reform it from the inside. But then obviously he got the, the papal bull, you know, saying that uh, he was excommunicated, which he burnt publicly. And so that, then there was this huge separation and you caused the Protestant movement. But in England, you had Tyndale. It wasn't really until Tyndale started um, doing his New Testament and um, talking about, um, you know, certain things in the church um, that it, it, um, people started following Tyndale and believing he was, you know, just a, basically a, a puppet of Luther, which isn't true. He was very unique. Obviously, he was influenced by that movement, but he, um, he until um, Tyndale in England, spirituality was was very much hidden. Uh, it was very persecuted, and that it was a, it was a Roman Catholic stronghold. And then all of a sudden, Henry VIII is like, "Well, let's let's just all become Protestants," you know, for his own gain. 
but um, he started this huge movement of, you know, printing Bibles and turned all, you know, the Roman Catholic churches into Protestant churches. And it's like he just basically flipped the whole boat. And so, um, you know, he did that for his own reasons, but that sort of worked out well for the advancement of the Word of God. And so, but what we see is we've got to put everything into its historical um, perspective. And so we might understand things that have happened in our era. Like I said, there's a, a, a BC and AD moment with the fall of Constantinople. There's a, also a BC and AD moment with the printing press. That, that was just absolutely revolutionary. It was like the internet had arrived. So you, you imagine, you know, the world before the internet and people in the 1980s, like, yeah, they've got their Encyclopedia Britannica and a few other things and they're reading that. It's like, that's how we get our knowledge, you know, you go to the local library, you know, but then it's just, you know, the, the tip of your fingers now, you can, you can read all that and a, a hundred times more. You can just go to, you know, like I was saying, go to Wikipedia, you go down the bottom, look at all the sources, look at look at the books, a world catalogue. That's what I was trying to look at before. If you go to the world catalogue, you can download these. You can go many times to archive.org and download these books and read them. And then if you don't understand what the Latin means, Google it and it's right there, you know. So um, this, so what had happened was most things were written um, with manuscripts. Manus just is Latin for hand. So handwritten manuscript. And um, then all of a sudden it's been printed everywhere. And so especially with the Greek, like that that was, um, yeah, the Latin had, had been quite early. And so people have become used to that. But then when the Greek came, people started learning Greek. And what a lot of people don't realize is Erasmus, he actually lived in England for three years and he taught in England. And some people even think that Tyndale... Um, was influenced by Erasmus there. Um, whether he actually ever saw Erasmus is not really known, um, but definitely there was a favourable um, group in Cambridge who looked towards Luther and they liked the movement. They looked towards Erasmus and they liked what he was doing. And so, um, but, so Erasmus, I'm pretty sure he taught at Oxford but um, I'm just going to pull up an article. So there's some uh, very good sites. This one here, um, the King James Bible, the King's Bible. Um, so this, a, a friend of mine um, does these. And so he just has like, you know, a bit of a, a short um, spiel about the Texas Receptus there and, um, these these sites are great, and so uh, many times, if you head down the bottom, you know he's the one who runs Texas Receptus Bibles, Webster's Dictionary, King James Bible Dictionary, King James Bible 1611, um, Treasury Scripture Knowledge. So he's got lots and lots of information there. Um, so he's uh, Texas Receptus Bibles page. So I'm just going to read the history of the Texas Receptus on that. Uh, so I'll just read through that because we're sort of already heading into the Complutensian Polyglot and Erasmus um, and going into those things. Um, we've been going for about 48 minutes. If anyone wants to join, um, jump on board. Um, if anyone wants to ask any questions or anything like that, feel free. Um, as we head into the Complutensian Polyglot information. But... I'm, I'm going to read through this article because he's got quite a lot of interesting things to say. So I'll enlarge in that for you guys so you can read along if you want. Okay. There is a great deal of misinformation regarding the origins of the Texas Receptus. This is especially true of the manner of which Desiderius Erasmus gave us his original Greek New Testament, which was published in 1516. It was this work that went on to become the foundation of the Texas Receptus. So Erasmus did not invent the Texas Receptus, but simply put together a collection of what was already the vast majority of New Testament manuscripts in the Byzantine tradition. The first Greek New Testament to be collated was Complutensian Polyglot in 1514, 
but it was not published until eight years later. Erasmus's was the second Greek New Testament, which was printed and published in 1516. So what we've got to understand is Complutensian Polyglot came first. So um, this seems to not be high in, in the mind of a lot of people. A lot of people mention the Complutensian Polyglot, but they will turn around and say, oh, Erasmus, uh, the Comi Johannium was introduced by Erasmus. Okay, so what about in 1514 when the Complutensian Polyglot had the Comi Johannium there? Um, so more than half a dozen manuscripts. The fact that Erasmus had only a handful of manuscripts during his preparation of the 1516 edition is irrelevant in regards to the reliability of the text underlying his manuscript. First of all, no scholar disputes the fact that Erasmus had studied variant readings of the New Testament throughout his life prior to publishing the Textus Receptus. In fact, the study of variant readings in the New Testament did not begin with Erasmus, but with scholars such as uh, Thomas Lineker. So he died in 1524 and John Collette, he died in 1519. And even as far back as Jerome in uh, 1420, uh, sorry, 420. Um, that would make Jerome pretty old. Although Erasmus spent only two years in front of a handful of Greek manuscripts to compose his first edition, his knowledge concerning the Greek New Testament and its variants did not come solely from looking at these few manuscripts in the two-year period. So Frederick Nolan, writing in um, 1815, states, in addition to the manuscripts which Erasmus owned or had seen himself, he gathered readings from various European nations um, through his broad friendships in universities, libraries, and monasteries. He noted, I have a room full of letters from men of learning. We find by the dates of his letters that he was corresponding at length and elaborately with the learned men of his time on technical points of scholarship, biblical criticism. So that's through the life and letters. Critics are also quick to point out that Erasmus's back, Erasmus back translated the last six verses of Revelation in his 1516 edition. And so we've dealt with um, that in a few videos. If you go through my playlist, you can see I've done, I think, two or three videos on, on that issue, uh, questioning a lot of the, the narrative of Delich and um, Tregellis. And we're going to go more and more into that. And so I'll probably do a whole program on that. And so that's the thing about these programs I want to do. Um, I was just asking on, on the Texas Receptus Academy the other day, and, and someone said, it'd be great to do a show on uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. So I'll do that. Also the Apocrypha. It'd be great to do one just on the Apocrypha, what it means, where it came from. And also, um, is Sinaiticus a fake, a fraud? So with those two issues, the Apocrypha and Sinaiticus, they're probably issues that I really need to um, come up to speed with. And so 1 Timothy 3.16, when it comes to just, you know, biblical, you know, um, the text, the words in the text, that's where I, I'd like to, um, I'm like a pig in mud um, when it comes to those sort of things the definition of terms, uh, looking at manuscripts, etc. But when it comes to concepts, uh, I'm a bit like, um, I, I guess they're, they're bigger fields. And I like to be, uh, when I speak about something, like e even this, the, the uh, history of the TR, it's, it's only, as you can see, it's only just sort of cursory looking at things and we're just sort of vaguely going over everything. Um, but... That's because I believe I've got a good grasp on that. But with with other things like the apocrypha, I, you know, I, I would just say, well, apocrypha is stupid, <laughs> and um, you know, don't have it, you know, sort of thing. And that would be, you know, my show, you know, and and turn it off. But um, obviously, there's there's way more to it than that, and I really should study more into that. But um, yeah. So, but if you have any ideas for shows that you want me to do, um. I had on my first show, Sean Cheatham, and he was saying that he would love to do um, um, stuff on the last six verses of Revelation. And so that would be great to do that. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I feel that there's enough of a question mark over that at the moment to warrant people looking into that more. 
And it would be great to have um, a lot of the TR um, proponents, uh, King James proponents, TR proponents, whatever people want to be labelled or whatever they get slanderously labelled as, you know, sometimes. Um, it would be great to, you know, sort of pull our um, our mental resources together and, and do, uh, you know, I would love for this program just to have, you know, 10 people, um, you know, 10 heads in here and us just discussing, you know, the fine points of, of scripture, um, discussing, you know, um, these issues, discussing, you know, um, you know, obviously we just did one on the comma last week. Uh, I don't want these just to be me just talking and ranting on because I, I want this to be more interactive and more live. But that's fine if it doesn't end up like that. You know, some things, you know, you plan and it doesn't happen, but it would be good to see people um, joining in and, um, you know, popping their head in and things like that. So I might even just... Uh, I'm just going to quickly, in Facebook... I'm just going to text someone and tell them I'm on Facebook. And that way they might actually jump on. Because some people last week they were like, oh, the show's over. And, you know, I think I went for like nearly four hours and told them all the way through the week. And they're like, yep, I'm going to join. I'm going to join. I'm going to join. And then it's like, oh, the show's over. You know, so it's it's hard. But um, I will just okay. okay. Back to this. So I'll just read through this uh, history, and then we'll go back to the Complutense in Polyglot. Um, but despite this charge, we see that Erasmus included a reading in Revelation 22, 20 that existed in the Greek and not in any edition of the Vulgate. Okay, so amen, even so come, instead of amen, veni, amen, come. This is one evidence that Erasmus was not confined to the readings contained in the few manuscripts placed before him uh, during his editing of the 1516 edition. At the very least, Erasmus consulted notes such as the annotations of Lorenzo Valla. So that's true. Um, and I touch on that, um, that, that, that is mentioned in his annotations that he went to the Codex uh, Laurentius, I think it was called, which is Lorenzo Valla's um, annotations. As for the alleged countless hundreds of printing errors in Erasmus's first edition, they were corrected in later editions of the Textus Receptus by Erasmus himself and never made their way into Bibles. And so, um, I mean, you're printing in Greek, like I said, there's, there's like a thousand different characters. Um, of course, there's you know, going to be the odd... Um, error print error I, I re it really annoys me when people go into the whole e area of print errors i had a guy the other day saying the king james is the most stupidest translation it has so many errors blah 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 and i said well point out one and he pointed out that there was the wicked bible <laughs> it's like um you know thou shalt commit adultery and i said so what about all the king james bibles that didn't have that reading how come you're only looking at that one you know uh, and it's like, and I said, well, so if I actually wrote out the Constitution of the United States and I, I had a whole bunch of errors in it, that means the Constitution of the United States has errors in it. Just because printers made mistakes, it doesn't make the text wrong. It's it's just one of the dumbest things. And so people are like, oh, you know, there's so many errors in Erasmus. Okay, I'd love to see James White, Dan Wallace, any of these guys, um, you know, grab a printer, um, you know, get someone to print in the same way that they did back then, you know, with the backwards, um, <laughs> you know, metal um, movable type and um, and create your own Greek text. I'd love to see them even just do one chapter of John or something like that. And, and it'd be filled with that. They wouldn't even be able to read, um, you know, the, the backwards letters. And, you know, half the time these guys were using mirrors just to, you know, see what they're doing and, you um, 
it's quite it was quite an interesting process anyway so um god only used a few manuscripts to preserve his words there is a theological problem with deriding the textus receptus on the basis that its original edition descends from a few j just a few manuscripts our theory of textual criticism must be based on what the bible says about textual transmission not on the philosophies of liberal theologians. The Bible is clear that God can use only a handful of manuscripts to preserve his word. And so the Bible describes a time, a time when Hilkiah, the high priest, found the book of the law, 2 Kings 22.8, or the book of the covenant, 2 Kings 23.2, in the house of the Lord during the reign of Josiah. Um, the book of the law, whether it was just five books of Moses or a collection of all the biblical books written up to that time, had to be rediscovered during uh, Josiah's reign because of the previous wicked generations under Manasseh and Amon, and apparently had apparent sorry, and Amon had apparently eradicated the book of the law from the land. This eradication of the biblical books was so widespread that even the high priest uh, did not possess them until he discovered them in the temple. This book found by Hilkiah became the ancestral copy of all the Hebrew manuscripts that exist today. One could speculate that Hilkiah found other manuscripts in other places over time, but that would be a speculation since the Bible does not say so. The Bible clearly portrays this single copy found in the temple as the sole catalyst for the great spiritual revival during Josiah's time and the rediscovery of God's words. Um, for subsequent generations. Ezra, a direct descendant of Hilkiah, Ezra 7.1, canonized the Old Testament and transmitted it to future generations. Ezra's Old Testament was surely based on Hilkiah's copy found in the temple. The readings of this copy eventually diverged into the various Old Testament streams extant today, such as the Masoretic Dead Sea Scrolls, Samaritan Pentateuch and the LXX. Whether or not Hilkiah or Ezra found other manuscripts besides the one found in the temple during Josiah's reign, the Bible is clear that the number of manuscripts does not matter as long as God providentially provides the manuscripts for a time of spiritual revival. King Josiah um, saw the hand of God in preserving this single copy and never doubted its authenticity or integrity. He caused the words of the single copy to be read to the people, 2 Kings 23, 2. There is a strong parallel between Hilkiah and Desiderius Erasmus, the originator of the Texas Receptus. Both men were high, of high repute and rank. Both were upright while their contemporaries were apostate. Both caused God's words to be published after a time of spiritual darkness. Both were catalysts of a great spiritual awakening. The Texas Receptus was to the Reformation what Hilkiah's discovery was to the revival in Josiah's days. Modern textual critics need to learn what the Bible says about textual transmission. If God wants his words to be published for a time of spiritual awakening, he can do so even um, through just one manuscript. So he can do so through even just one manuscript. So um, I would have a tiny little bit of pushback there so this, this is not my website. So this is um, uh, Keith Mason's site, the Texas Receptus Bibles. And so I would say, yes, I would agree with that. Uh, absolutely. But I'd also say um, that the majority of manuscripts back up the Texas Receptus. And so we can see that the majority of manuscripts, the majority of readings do usually favor the TR. And so this embarrassment of riches that's talked about by Dan Wallace um, is usually just thrown straight in the bin and they go for the minority readings of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. So many times they're just going with these two manuscripts. So we can look at an example of the last 12 verses of Mark. Um, they're deleted because of two manuscripts. So only two manuscripts um, don't have it. There, there is another one, but that's, I think, a 13th century manuscript. Um, but there are um, 1,637, I think it is, Greek manuscripts that do have it. So you're looking at 99.9% .9 of all Greek manuscripts have it. Two don't. 
so when they're talking about minority readings, it's like um, if these guys regulate the whole Byzantine tradition in the Nestle Alien or United Bible Society text, just to an M majority text or a B, BYZ Byzantine in, in the margin, and that can sometimes represent, you know, 1,500 manuscripts, surely it doesn't really matter if, if how many um, manuscripts Erasmus had. If he had, um, if he had five manuscripts, he's got five that are usually mostly cohesive, and they agree with each other because, you know, even the Nestle Island that that just has BYZ down the bottom of the page, and so um, as long as these were good representatives of the Byzantine text. Now, if Erasmus had gone through Europe looking at manuscripts for years and years and years, if he had been part of the Byzantine school in Venice for years, if he had been a proofreader in Aldous's print um, shop for, for you know, seven months you know, there and, and did proofreading and you know, going over his Greek printed manuscripts and things like that, he was, he was an expert in Greek. And so um, he would have looked at a manuscript and said, yes, this is a good good copy. Just like we look at a Bible version and we go, okay, well, this is a poor Bible version. This is a good Bible version. You can tell when you're, when you're fluent in English, you, can, you know the text, you look at Bibles and you go, hang on, this, uh, you know, the NLT, uh, I don't know about that, or, you know, the passion, <laughs> that's rubbish, a message, whatever. Of the Jehovah's Witness, but you, you know, just by looking at the text, and so he would have looked at texts and gone. It's not like he would have just been desperate for anything. He he had gone throughout Europe, and the thing is, the libraries aren't just going to say, "Oh, Erasmus, you're here. Here, keep our manuscripts." Of course, they're not going to do that. And so he was writing down the variants. He was writing down. You know, he would have had a, a text. After a while, he would have stopped writing. You know, copying the whole thing. He would have just been like, I can just write down the difference. So he would have had lists of variants and things like that. And then when he's making his text, he's just using something as a guideline, but he's using all of his former knowledge and understanding to create the correct text. Um, and so while I, I understand, you know, um, Keith Mason is saying throughout history and biblical history, we can see that you know sometimes one manuscript is discovered and that's enough um it's actually not what happened with erasmus and so erasmus was the author of five published editions of um from 1516 to 1535 here we go with our pop-ups again <clears throat> okay um being the very first Textus Receptus. And so this is where I guess we're going to be looking at the term Textus Receptus um, because the term Textus Receptus is, um, so we're looking at Erasmus there, I'll put that there. It's, it's a term that's retroactively used upon the Greek text. And so... Um, sometimes it can be confusing to just have a label like that. Like if we just called it Greek editions of the New Testament, you, you wouldn't, you know, it, it wouldn't make that much of a big deal, but because it's called Texas Receptus and then you're a Texas Receptus only, and oh, you must like this edition and that edition and they, they're a Texas Receptus edition too, you know, and they try to catch you on these, these things. It's like, you know, give me a break. Um, and so sometimes, you know, saying oh, Erasmus was the first. I usually say Complutense and Polyglot was the first Texas Receptus because it is a TR edition. <laughs> okay, let's just keep reading through this. Actually, what I should do because it... Yeah, I'll just read through this because this is, gives us a summary of where we're going. Okay. There, there were approximately 30 distinct editions of the Texas Receptus made over the years. Each differs slightly from the others. Um, there have been over 500 printings. These variations include spelling, accents and breathing marks, word order and other minor differences. The editions of Stevens, Beza and the Elzevers all present substantially the same text. 
and the variations are not of great significance and rarely affect the context. I would say sometimes there is, uh, there are things that do create issues. And so that's why I don't just defend, okay, well, Stefanis did a TR edition, so I'm running with that. That's And, and I'm going to defend that. And, you know, it's like, well, yes, I'll defend the vast majority of it, but where it differs from the accepted TR that I believe is the TR, um, I'm going to say it's got error in it. I'm just going to be flat out honest about that. And uh, well, not so much honest, but just, you know, state the facts, you know, where um, some people like all oh, the TRs are sort of, they're good, you know, it's like, well, yeah, they're way better than the critical text or even the Catholic, the Clementine Vulgate that they had is way better than the critical text today. Even the Catholic text is better, you know. The third edition of Stephanus's TR, the 1550, became the standard form of the Greek New Testament in England. Theodore Beza, and we see that also with the London polyglot of um, 1657. So they used this, the text of Stephanus. Okay. Theodore Beza published four independent editions from 1565 to 1604. Uh, his text was essentially... Um, a reprinting of the Stephanus uh, third edition, 1550, with minor changes. The Stephanus 1550 text, as given in Beza's edition of the 1598, was the main source of the translators of the 1611 uh, King James Version of the Bible. And so there are a few little things here that aren't accurate, aren't correct, but I'm going to deal with this when we get to um, Stephanus and Beza and things like that. So... The Elziva, so like yeah, the Elziva brothers, they're not brothers. It's quite common to call them brothers. And even in, if you look at the TR, printed by the Trinitarian Bible Society, it's only got two pages in English. But when you look at the word, when it says Elziva partners, and it's quite interesting it, that it says that because I'll just enlarge in this. Where are we? I'm not sure if you can see that. See where it says uh, their partners. You can tell that it's sort of like it's on a bit of an angle. It's like it's been pasted over the top of it. I think they had Elziva brothers because it was quite a common error uh, to make. And so, uh, and lots of people have made that error. And I just keep hearing it. Elzeva brothers. Um, not that it really matters, but you know, you want to you want to have everything tight, and you want to get rid of things that are just error. You know. So the Elzeva uncle and nephew uh, printed seven editions of the Greek New Testament between um, 1624 and 1678. Unlike the editions of Erasmus, Stephanus, and Beza before them, the Elzevas were not. Uh, editors of the editions attributed to them only the printers, the Elziva, um, the Elziva uh, uncle and nephew, 1633, made another reprint of Stephanus's 1550 text, which became the most popular text on the European continent. See, I, I don't think that that's a actually accurate because, I mean, they have the readings of Beza, um, uh, the 1598 of Beza, sometimes in the 1633 text, and so... Um, there are approximately 93 differences between Stephanus 1550 and Beza 1598. These differences are minor and pale into significance when compared with the approximately 6,000, it's actually 8,000 differences between the text of Receptus and the Nestle Alan text, um, many of which quite is substantial between the Alexandrian critical text and the Texas Receptus. So um, it, all up, that's a very good um overview of that and it's good to go through these articles um uh you know keith mason's done quite a good job of this and um you know he's got like say theodore b's a nine edition so that actually comes from my website i used to say that now i'm like no theodore b's did five editions one of them was in latin four of them were in greek and then he, he did a whole bunch of you know, like he might just print the Greek or he might print the Latin or he might print the Greek and the Latin without the notes. And, you know, he, he did a whole bunch of other things, but there was basically five editions. And so, um, <clears throat> but when Keith was making this website, we were sort of, you know, 
chatting a lot and working together on some of these. So there's probably probably a little bit of influence from myself on this site that could be in error because it's old material. But the more I've plugged along over the years, especially over the last five years, I've cleared up a lot of that stuff and I'll show you that on my website. So let's go back to the Complutensian Polyglot. So, okay, I'm just going to read through a little bit of this. Complutensian Polyglot Bible was the name given to the first printed polyglot of the entire Bible. The edition was uh, initiated and financed by Cardinal Francisco Jimenez de Cisneros. So he died in 1517. So it's quite interesting. A lot of these guys had... I think it was um, Aldous died in 1517 as well. And so you have this whole generation. They're given their life to this stuff, paid all the money that they had, you know, to, to do this stuff, and then uh, then they passed away. Um, and the published, and sorry, published by Complutense University in um, Alcala de Henares, Spain. I probably said that really wrong. Um, it includes the first printed editions of the Greek New Testament, so the first printed, so it's very important they understand this is the first printed edition of the Greek New Testament, okay? Um, so at the complete Septuagint and of the Targum Onkelos. And so um, the Aramaic Targum or Torah accepted as authoritative uh, translated text of the five, book of, five books of Moses. Um, of the 606 volume sets, only 123 are known to survive today. So that's one of the things I've pointed out is there's only 20% of these left. And this is 500 years old. Now, imagine a manuscript, you know, 500 years before that, how many would be left? What, 10%, 5%? Then you think back to 1,500 years, how many would be left? And so there were most likely millions of biblical manuscripts floating around. I mean, we have quite a lot today. You know, the, there's a debate over how, how many, you know, Greek manuscripts. But we have like 10,000 Latin manuscripts, uh, you know, uh, roughly about, you know, 5,300 um, Greek manuscripts. And so so this is how they had uh, the competence in polyglot. So I'll just enlarge in this for you here. So this is uh, the Hebrew um the latin and the greek septuagint here and so you could go through and uh, as you can see it's got the greek and then it's got the latin above it so it's it's a parallel as well so th this is this is very scholarly you've got marginal notes um so the way they they said you got the greek on one side you got the hebrew on the other and you're the latin in the middle so they said oh it's like jesus is in the middle because they prefer the latin obviously and um, you know he he's next to two thieves, sort of thing. And um, so I won't read through all of that. But the work started in fifteen oh two, took fifteen years. And so when they talk about Erasmus, oh, you know Erasmus, he just rushed to print, and he was slipping on banana peels, and he didn't know what he was doing, and the printer just wanted to rush against the Complutensian polyglot and all this sort of stuff. Almost all of that is just rubbish. It's just designed to make Erasmus look like he didn't know what he was doing. And so there, there are a lot of anecdotes about Erasmus. Um, Jeff Riddle talks about a lot of these anecdotes, um, you know, the rash wager that he'd, he'd insert the comma if someone just found one manuscript, um, the rush to print, you know, he was rushing to try to beat the Complutensian. There's really no proof of that. Um, I mean, the Complutensian was going to get published when the Old Testament was published. If you understand how the Complutensian polyglot worked, um, when you look at, you know, what is here, you've got the Hebrew, and the Hebrew dictionary actually appears in the earlier New Testament. So this was released in 1522. I think it was finished in 1520. But, um, and there might have been restrictions by the Pope or whatever. But at the end of the day, they wanted to um, publish them together. They wanted to publish these. Yeah, these were huge volumes. If you go through and you just look at them, if you look at the New Testament and you look at the dictionaries that they have in there, 
um, they're, they're massive and they interweave between themselves. So you have the New Testament and the Old Old Testament, um, or the New Testament will have the text. Then the vast majority of the rest of the manuscript is like a dictionary going back to the Old Testament. And so they've sort of worked out you can have both books open at once and you can look at the dictionary of one and look at the dictionary of the other and all the rest of it. And so um, this is huge. This is absolutely huge. And so um, and you have a translation, I guess, of the Chaldean and um, here. You've got the Chaldean there and a translation of it. So this is quite interesting. This is a very interesting text um, and... I recommend anyone who wants to, you know, dive into the Complutensian polyglot. It's um, it's a very interesting topic. And so, um, what else can I say about this? So, who were the guys behind it? Um, so yeah, let, let's just look at this um, Erasmian, you know, the publishing privileges. In the meantime, word of the Complutensian polyglot re reached Desiderius Erasmus in Rotterdam who produced his own printed edition of the Greek New Testament, Erasmus obtained an exclusive four-year publishing privilege from Emperor, Emperor Maximilian. So it was four years, but the Complutensian Polyglot wasn't finished until uh, 1520. And so why didn't they sell it until 1522? Um and so, yeah, it just some of these stories just sort of, you know, I think some of these, uh, it's a bit of poetic license on history. Um, I, you know, it's these are things that need to be really looked at and, and studied and thought about. So, um, Theodore Beza's Greek New Testament was used primarily, primarily along with Erasmus's Greek New Testament text with various readings from the Computensian Greek New Testament text to form the Textus Receptus published by the Elzebra brothers, you know, so they've got another error there, uh, in 1633. Um, Erasmus's uh, later edition um, was a secondary source for the King James Version of a New Testament. Um, the Computensian Polyglot Bible was a tertiary source for the 1611 King James Bible. Da, da, da. So, okay, so I'm going to jump to my website here, tr.org.au, and my keyboard's not working there, tr.org.au. Yep. Okay, so, and if anyone wants to join us, just type that in to your internet browser and you can just join us. You'll be a bobbing head there and you can chat along with us. Now, um, if you do want to join us, just, um, I know I'm not using headphones. I've got my headphones here just in case. They're all charged up. Um, if things start getting a bit e echoey or whatever, I can just, you know, throw these on and it's fine. Um, they keep my phone charging actually. But, uh, yeah, and so if you do want to join, just jump in and just start chatting about any of this. You know, you, you might know quite a lot more than I do about Erasmus or the Complutensian Polyglot Bible. Um, so let's just look down here. So I might just read a little bit of my site. The Texas Receptus is a name retroactively given to the succession of printed Greek language texts of a New Testament, which constituted the textual base of the German Luther Bible for the translation of the New Testament into English by William Tyndale, 1526, Miles Coverdale Bible, Matthew's Bible, Great Bible, Geneva Bible, Bishop's Bible, King James Bible, and for most other Reformation New Testament translations throughout Western and Central Europe, such as the Spanish Rena Valera translation and the Czech Bible of Grilake. And so, um, this is quite interesting. 
Although six chapters of John were printed at Venice as early as 1504 by Aldus Minutius. So he, in 1504, he'd already done six chapters of John. This is Aldus, the printer who Erasmus stayed with for seven months. And the whole of that gospel was printed in Tambingen in Sobia in 1512. These editions are interesting only as literary curiosities, for though they constituted the first portion of the Greek Testament ever committed to the press, they exercise no influence whatsoever on succeeding editions. Now, I really do have to look into those claims. This has been on my website for like 10 years. But um, how do I know? I mean, I, I didn't really know that much about Aldous when I wrote that. But if we are to look at, I'm just going to, I might shut that one down. I'm just going to look at, well, and yeah, by the way, this is that, that video that I, I recommend everyone watch, How Aldous Minutius Saves Civilization. I recommend you go there. And so um, I might just copy that. And so um, very, very good lecture. It only goes for like an hour or so. Yeah, just about an hour. So I'll just shut that one down. So I've just got so many pages open here that I'm sort of confusing myself a little bit. Um, okay, so I'm actually looking for a book. Where is that book? Um, here. So I'll throw this up. So this is a book, An Introduction to the Literary History of the Bible by James Townley. And so he says here, the first printed edition of any part of the Greek Testament is one by Aldous Minutius, who printed the first six chapters of John's Gospel at Venice in 1504 and in 1512, the whole of St. John's Gospel was printed at uh, Tabingen in Salbia. And so then it goes on and talks about other Hebrew, Arabic, um, etc. Um, so, yeah, quite interesting. Um, the New Testament, its first edition of the whole Greek Testament ever printed, so we're talking about that, the Polyglot Bible. Um, it was not published until 1522 and the whole Bible was made public. So that, to me, it's more so that the whole Bible was completed in 1522 is the reason that that's why it came out. More so than you know, Erasmus put a stop to it. You know, can you, can you imagine that? And when we read through... Um, issues with Erasmus. So I'll just open this up again. Um, I've got here uh, Spain's Polyglot Bible and Erasmus's Greek New Testament. This should probably be capitalised. In 1502 in Spain, so I've read through most of that, but I'll read this, I'll read this again. 1502 in Spain, Cardinal Francisco Jimenez de Cisneros had put together a team of Spanish translators to create a compilation of the Bible in four languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Latin. Translators for Greek were commissioned from Greece itself and worked closely with the Latinists. Cardinal Cisneros's team um, completed and printed the full New Testament, including the Greek translation in 1514. To do so, they developed specific types um, to print Greek. Cisneros informed Erasmus of the works going on in Spain and may have sent a printed version of the New Testament to him. So can you imagine that? Imagine Erasmus having this edition. And it's not beyond the realm of believability to think that that happened. However, the Spanish team wanted the entire Bible to be released as one single work and withdrew from publication. And as I said before, the, the way they designed the books was the Hebrew definitions were at the end of the New Testament. And then the Hebrew Bible was in, so there was, 
it was the old, old and the new and so these were different books and so um that's got to be taken into consideration that you couldn't just have you imagine having like a study bible with all the study notes in one thing for the old testament you got the say you got the new testament and all the old testament study notes in one what are you going to release that without the old testament <laughs> and then the new testament study notes in the old testament section uh, you're not going to you have to release these at the same time and so this this i think is uh that comes against the whole concept that you know, erasmus has just sort of put a roadblock in front of cisneros here the information and the delay allowed Erasmus to request a um, publication privilege of four years. Um, so they might have said, look, we've, we've got four years left until we, we're probably going to finish. And so, yeah, you, you can print your thing. They might have said that. You know what I mean? Uh, four years for the Greek New Testament to ensure these work would be published first. He obtained it in 1516 from both Pope Leo X and just on a side note, if you want to look into that era, like I recommend everyone watch that movie, Luther, you know, that came out about 10 years ago. Really good movie. Um, there's a little bit of you know, historical spin on it, but as a, as a whole, it's like, you know, 95% there. If you watch that, you get a general understanding of Luther. Um, but I would also look at Pope Leo X, very interesting guy. And also look at um, the Medici's. If you want to understand the history of this time, you've got to understand that the Medici's were the uh, basically like, you know, the um, uh, the Rothschilds sort of thing of that era. And they started becoming popes and they started becoming cardinals and they realised that's where power was. So they, they followed the power. They had money, which gave them power, but then they realised being a pope or being, you know, a, a cardinal, that gave you ultimate power. And so it's quite interesting to follow that rabbit trail of the corruption that came from the Medici's and spread. And a lot of people knew about this. They knew a lot of these popes would, were bought into the Vatican. And so that's why in this era, people were tired of, of this type of rubbish. So that's a whole another rabbit trail. It's really quite interesting um, to go down. Um so he would dedicate his work to Pope Leo X and Emperor Maximilian I. One, uh, Erasmus's Greek New Testament was published first in 1516, forcing the Spanish team of Cisneros to wait until 1520 to publish their Complutensian polyglot Bible. Um, and so, yeah, so that's something that I'm looking into more and more. I, I just... Um, leaning more towards no the complutensian polyglot bible they were working on the old testament and it just it was finished 1520 and they published it 1522 that's just what happened um it is hard to say if erasmus's actions had an effect on delaying the publication of the Compl complutensian polyglot causing the spanish team to take more time or if it made no difference in their perfectionism the spanish copy was approved for publication by the Pope in 1520. However, it was not released until 1522 due to the team's insistence on reviewing and editing. Only 15 errors have been found in the entire six volumes and four languages of Cisneros's Bible, an extraordinarily low number for the time. The fear of their publishing first, uh, though, affected Erasmus's work, rushing him to printing and causing him to forego editing. Uh, the result was a large number of translation mistakes, um, uh, manuscript errors, typos, etc. And so um, there are some things there that um, I probably would amend or I would put question marks over anyway. It, it's commonly thought that, that you know, these mistakes were by Erasmus rushing. Now, I know Erasmus, he did say things like, you know, um, it was um, pre precipitated. The text was precipitated. And, and so, but the thing is, I've caught some of these translators of Erasmus's letters, like especially Jan Kranz, writing things 
um, into English, which simply aren't there in the Latin. And he's just, I've pointed it out, and he's like, I'm like, why does Erica Rummel translate it this way and you're translating it that way? Who's right and who's wrong? You know, and so these are the go to experts for um, how you translate the. Um, the Latin of Erasmus and they're differing from each other. And so, um, so I'm just gonna, what I was looking for was it might actually be Okay, revered by Cisneros. Okay, so Francisco Jimenez de Cisneros, who funded the Complutense in Polyglot, tried to recruit Erasmus to work on the project twice. In November 1516, the abbot of Husilios wrote to Cisneros praising Erasmus's Novum Instrumentum Omne, uh, the new instrument his first edition of the Great New Testament, which had just been printed by Froben Press. The abbot praised Erasmus as a good theologian, knowledgeable in Greek and Hebrew, and an elegant Latin stylist. He suggested to Cisneros that he employ Erasmus to work on the Complutense in Polyglot project. Given that he has anticipated your reverence with his publication, I believe that he could be of assistance in making your work appear somewhat more polished. I believe that your reverence would not deprive um, yourself of a person like Erasmus. You should avail yourself of his assistance in the correction of the whole publication and hire his services for a certain period. So Erasmus declined the, inv the invitation and was again approached in May 1517. Erasmus briefly states the reason for his second refusal. The Cardinal of Toledo has invited me again, but I do not like Spain. <laughs> so it's just a, a way to you know, get out of it. Um, in 1527, Jan uh, Vergara refers to the matter in a letter to Erasmus, calling, uh, recalling that Cardinal Cisneros, the founder of the Complutense University, had the most wonderful esteem for you and was keen on enjoying your company. And so uh, you're looking at, that's the year that he died, you know, 1517. So he's like, Erasmus is like, oh, look, I'm doing my own thing. I don't want to be involved. And see, the thing was too, when you look at Cisneros, he was a wild man. Look at him. He's a monk. Um, he was one of the main players in the Inquisition. So, you know, the Spanish Inquisitions that had been going on for years, like he he was into burning people and he was, he was full on. You know, he's into the crusade sort of thing. He's, but the thing is that all these guys, you know, they're interested in, academics and they're interested in the texts and so he's hiring a bunch of guys to do all this work and it's like they're, they're doing a bunch of work for him and so um so anyway i'll i'll continue on so where did we get to we got to yeah, I think we've sort of looked at the Complutense and Polyglot and the influence on Erasmus, the influence on the Textus Receptus. Um, I've questioned a few things that I've, you know, believed because a lot of this material, it's like, it's really hard to get your head around things when there's so much deliberate misinformation about the Textus Receptus. I mean, you know, one minute er Erasmus is, you know, he doesn't really know Greek that well and he's just bumbling along. The next minute you listen to people and they're saying, no, he was so good at Greek that he was revered by the Byzantine scholars who would escape from Constantinople. Um, he was revered by those guys. And, you know, in a sense of, you know, that those people and their offspring and, and, and the rest of it. And he, he was seen as one of 
the greatest Greek linguist of, of that era. And so um, one minute he's an idiot and the next minute he's a hero. And so it's like, um, obviously in the last, you know, how, however long I've run this website for 2008, I've put stuff up there and then I'm reading back through it going, I'm probably going to have to rewrite that because I'm just, I don't think that that mainstream narrative fits anymore with what we know about he, the influence that he had. And he spent a lot of time with Aldous. I mean, how can he be a bumbling fool in the Greek language if he is proofreading for Aldous? I mean, you know, so anyway, um, I'll just show that link again, StreamYard, if you want to join. Uh, okay, so we have another comment. Nick, do you know any modern Greek? Um, when it comes to modern Greek, um, I know a little bit. Um, in Melbourne, where I grew up, the three biggest cities for Greeks are Athens, Thessaloniki, and then Melbourne, Australia, quite surprisingly. And so I've worked with Greeks who spoke Greek all day, every day, listened to Greek radio, greeted me in Greek. Um, and the only thing I really learned from them was the accent. And so um, many times we would see someone from Melbourne and we'd say, oh, Mad, how are you going, Mad? Or the, we'd speak like full Greek. At the moment, or just last week, I've been working with a guy, another Greek guy. He's 74. And so, you know, we say, Tikanes in the morning, Kalimera. And he teaches me, you know, don't say phileis because that means kiss. Say phile, you know, it means you friend, a good morning friend and things like that. So I know a little bit of modern Greek. Um, I would love to know more. Um, I'm studying, um, I guess I learned the Erasmian um, pronunciation, which is pretty much, it's a bit of a slight on Erasmus. It's more so American <laughs> pronunciation of the Greek. Um, and so I'm trying to unlearn that and go to the modern Greek because I think it'll be more beneficial. Um, I listen to the modern Greek Bible nearly every day. Um, and so when I say modern Greek, we're looking at, you know, basically the, the Texas Receptus read by a modern Greek reader. And so, yeah, um, I've been learning modern Greek as a second language and I've been able to read the Koine New Testament with little problems. Well, it was interesting, um, probably about three years back, um, it was Taylor de Soto, Dane Johansson, and they were doing Greek studies in a um, Greek uh, forum setting with a guy called Stephen Anderson. Now, you've probably heard of him. Now, I don't necessarily like Stephen Anderson that much. There are some things that he does which are great. It's a bit like a, a Luther or something, you know. Great, you, you've said this, but other things, it's like, why are you saying that? That's heretical, that's stupid, and all the rest of it. But anyway, besides, you know, his um, controversial nature, these guys did a video together where they went to Crete and they went around just using the, um, the Koine Greek New Testament, reading it to people. Um, they were memorizing it. They were quoting it as they went door to door, preaching to people and most people could understand it. And so the difference that they said between modern Greek and Koine Greek was basically about the difference between the English that we use today in modern everyday interaction and the uh, English of 1611. So usually if you're reading 1611 Bible to someone, that they'll get the gist, you know, that, um, and, you know, there might be a word or two you have to look up. And so that, that's what they're saying is probably the the difference so the morphology of greek has been stable and it's been the bible that's actually kept it stable for two thousand years and so a lot of the words actually still just mean the same thing and so um you know the greeks it's still a living language they haven't been um you know reading the bible in swahili for you know two thousand years they've been reading it in greek they've been studying it in greek their history is in greek and so this um yeah, so I, I would probably push towards a modern, uh, if you're learning Greek, go for the modern. Um, Spiros Od Hyades, um, I had a tape of his years ago that I used to go through and because he's a native speaker, uh, he would say, oh, the word is pronounced this way. And so I was going through that, but I just find that, um, yeah, 
you've sort of got to learn both ways. You've got to learn the Eraspian and the modern because sometimes you don't understand what people are going on about when they're talking about monogenes and you know you're like well what are you talking about and, and monogenes and the, the difference in just having that greek way of saying it it just makes so much difference but um but i find myself i'll be halfway through a word and i'm like I'm, I'm pronouncing this wrong and so i really need to brush up on pronunciation with greek but um yeah um so thanks for the question so but yeah erasmus he was definitely um, fluent he was writing books in greek that aldous was printing and um, he'd already done a latin bible so he'd done a latin bible he had a whole bunch of um uh he had a whole bunch of greek manuscripts that he was using for that latin bible so then in the end it was like well i've i've learned the greek i've learned the latin I'm, I may as well just put these together so people can see what's going on. Um, well, not so much learn the Greek, learn the Latin. Of, I know these languages fluently. Um, I'm using the Greek to polish the Latin there and to um, amend any place where there's error. And so um, I may as well let people know what's happening here. Um, so there was... Yeah, the travels of Erasmus. So, yeah, Erasmus lived in England. Um, so he first set sail there in 1505, but then he was there um, 1509 to 1514. So that's quite a long time. It's five years. So he lectured at Cambridge. That's right, because I said Oxford before, but um, I, because I was like, actually, the Cambridge guys were supporting him, but I think he was at Oxford. And I couldn't figure out why I'd said that. It was just a wrong um, thing to say he worked on scholarly scholarly projects including the greek text of the new testament so he worked there in england on the greek text and so this is very important when it comes to looking at yeah you know, the anglo-saxon bibles which um the anglo-saxon gospels uh when you look at you know wycliffe's translation when you look at these things um he would have known these things he was good friends with thomas more and um, met with uh, King Henry, Henry VIII. And so, man, th these guys, I mean, you could make, um, you could make movies, you could make a whole series and do a hundred, um, you know, two hour length movies on just what's happened between, you know, the, the fall of Constantinople and the King James. It's, there's so much riches, richness in there. Um, you know, and c characters like Henry VIII and Thomas More, and um, yeah, so and you know, how we lived in Italy, he arrived in Italy 1506, spent three years there. Um, he went to Italy to perfect his knowledge of Greek, so he already knew Greek, but he's perfecting it. Um, so he is living with, um, um, Paolo Bombasio, remember Bombasius, the guy who's sort of like the custodian of Codex Vaticanus, who's writing letters. He lived with this guy for 13 months with Bombasius. He wasn't just a pen pal. He knew this guy. Uh, this introduced Erasmus to the upper echelon of Greek scholarship of that era. So all the Greek scholars were looking to Erasmus and saying this guy's a legend. Um. So, yeah, it's it's quite interesting to see where he lived. He lived in, you know, Italy. So, yeah, that's what I say. Well, he was three years in Italy and he never once went to the Roman, uh, to, to the library in, in the Vatican and never once looked at Vaticanus. He never once, you know, it's like, it, it just amazes me that um, people just say, no, Erasmus never saw it. It's like, well, how do you know that? Well, because there's no record of it. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so just because he didn't mention it, um, you, you just assume that he never saw it. You know, he was scouring all the libraries of Europe for different readings and different manuscripts. But, you know, Vatican Library, no. That uh, that day he went there, there was just this green gas just hanging around and he just, we went to go up the stairs. He was like, oh, 
I can't go in there. There's this gas and, and he nearly fainted and had to be carried. You know, it's like, pff, what a load of rubbish. You know, it's like, um, yeah, that, that's just as believable as saying he didn't see it because they're just making it up, but they just say, oh, no, he didn't see it. It's, it's, it's creating something from an omission of history, and it's like you, you can't do that. You, you, you can speculate. I can speculate too that there was green gas coming out of there that day and he, he didn't, you know, he couldn't stand it, and so he fell over and nearly died and then got, you know, you can make up whatever, but it's like at the end of the day, it makes more sense to think that he went to those libraries. If he's living with Bombasius for 13 months, the guy who eventually gave him readings, I know there was Sepul Sepultiva, uh, gave him some readings as well. I mean, I, I haven't done enough study to see, you know, he probably stayed with him too. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, um, but the more I discover these things, it's like a, a a different picture than the James White Dan Wallace sort of cursory look at things. It's like, oh, he's only interested in the Greek. He was never really interested in the Latin and all this stuff. And uh, Sorry, he was only interested in the Latin. He was never really interested in the Greek. And it's like, okay, um, how do they know that for sure? You know, so anyway, so um, brand new ACC says that makes me glad I've never learned the Eraspian pronunciation. I only know the modern. I would stick with the modern. Um, the only reason you want to know Eraspian is to understand um, what the Anglo Sanhedrin talk about. So that's the, the English, uh, usually American, um, you know, preachers and, um, you know, they'll talk about agape and, um, phileo and you know it's just an american twang on on it and so to understand what they're going on about sometimes you would learn that but um yeah and usually it's to refute what they're saying and so held evanson says going back to the greek docker by stephen anderson highly recommended and so yeah i would recommend that um you know obviously i don't um really gel on Stephen Anderson. I think he says a lot of heretical things, but there's some things that he's you know, good on, you know, and um, I think this is the thing. Some people, even on this text issue, you can have someone who's just totally off the wall and say correct things about the text receptors because it's just like mathematics. I mean, if I'm a maths teacher and I say, you know, one plus one equals two, it doesn't matter if I'm a serial killer or if I'm, you know, Hitler or I'm a Pope or whatever. That's true. One plus one does equal two. So just because I say something that's true doesn't mean that you have to follow me or, you you know, I'm endorsing someone because I'm like, well, this guy said this and it's true or whatever. And some of what he says is true. And if so, if you go through, um, Stephen Anderson did a 30, um, uh, 30 episode uh, video course on the Greek language, on the Greek, I'm um, reading the Greek New Testament. And so it's quite good. Uh, I would recommend anyone go through that. The only reason I don't just go out of my way to recommend it is because uh, without all these caveats, um, people think I'm recommending Stephen Anderson. Or I'm not. I'm just saying, okay, he's like a maths teacher. What he's saying, he's correct. But what he's saying about, you know, gays can never be saved and they should commit suicide. It's like, get real, man. You know, they can be saved. The blood of Jesus can cover all sin, you know. And so I think the guy's a heretic, personally. Um, I think he does a lot of damage to people. And sometimes people who are close to truth and then they have those weird things. They actually do way more damage than someone who's just out there and they're just really bizarre. Because people, they think, well, they're, but they're so good on other things. And it's like, well, yeah, well, you know, maths teacher, they could be a serial killer, but they can get every one of their equations correct, you know. So, yeah, going back to the Greek by Stephen Anderson, I'll just quickly look up. Um, if you go to um, Anderson, um, lessons is... These ones here. So I would recommend you probably just go through these. Hello, this is Pastor. Um, usually this is in a timeline. But if, yeah, if you go to educational videos and lectures, uh, playlists, 
um, here. 27 videos. So he goes through the pronunci pronunciation, um, the Greek alphabet, um, etc. The only thing is, it's like um, this generation seems to be like, if I said, whatever you do, don't go and eat muesli bars because muesli bars have poison in them, blah, blah, blah. Pe people who have never even thought of eating a muesli bar will go, I'm going to eat a muesli bar now because that guy said I can't. You know, it's like that's the generation we live in. It's like if you say just don't do it, people, it's like the kids, don't touch the oven. It's the only thing they really want to touch from them on. It's like whatever's forbidden, you know, so I'm like don't go near Stephen Anderson, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you know, and I've had heaps of people do that. And so that's why I, I always just say, I think he's a loop, really. But um, yeah, it's, and you know, obviously I, I don't, you know, choose who is a TR advocate or a King James proponent or whatever. People just become that, and some people even in cults they go, okay, well, I, I believe that the text of receptors, King James, you know, um, some people who I wouldn't necessarily hang around with or have doctrinal agreement with they they're like okay well i think king james um tr you know etc and so um yeah so with this i try to keep the tr king james version issue sort of neutral because um i understand that there are people of all sorts of backgrounds uh, and we probably would, you know, have debates on eschatology and, you know, different types of things. And so, um, but I try to keep it neutral. I try not to get involved in all those other issues while I'm doing this because I want to just, I believe this is a very important issue that people, um, the more that we're sort of being neutral on those things, and I think Jeff Riddle does a pretty good job of that too. Obviously, he brings in the um, the reformed flavor but it's pretty hard not to bring in the reformed flavor when this is a reformation you know and most of these guys are influenced by calvin by beza um etc so wallace wrote um so this is kept pure in all ages he wrote we do not have now in our critical texts or any translations exactly what the authors of the new testament wrote uh wallace continued even if we did we would not, not know it. There are many, many places in which the text of the New Testament is uncertain. And so that, that is insanity. What it's saying is God has not preserved his word. What they say is God preserved his word in the manuscripts. Now, we believe that the manuscripts, what, one of the key issues with the Textus Receptus is that there is a change in technology. So that's why we go, okay, well, where is the Texas Receptus today? Or where is the correct words of God today? And we, we believe we can point to them because there is a change in technology. When you look at manuscripts, even just one guy, you know, writing out a manuscript from another text, he's going to make mistakes. Handwritten manuscripts, it's just part and parcel of knowing about manuscripts is that, that you understand that they're going to make error. They're going to do parablepsis, Architeaton, homoeteaton, uh, they're gonna um, they're gonna spell things wrong. The, you know, sometimes the, the name John is spelled you know, differently, you know, three times in the same chapter. You know, it's and so the thing is the technology changed. The technology went from that to a precise printed text. So then you're gonna have the same thing everywhere. Uh, on every page it's going to be exactly identical and so then you're more concerned with getting the exact word there you, you're sort of getting the mic microscope out and you you're working out the exact words and so this is where i would um i would say it's, it's a bit like what's happened with the internet so obviously the internet's come along we have um you know someone you know back in the 90s went Let's put the Bible on the internet. So maybe they uploaded uh, the the corrected King James by Scrivener in uh, what was it, 18, uh, 80 or eighteen seventy three or something like that. You know, he 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 did an edition and he changed a whole bunch of things. Strain at and that became strain out and that, and he he actually added errors. But 
um yeah he was trying you know even though he was mostly a critical text guy in, in, in his heart he um his text might have been put up first and then later on someone went hang on that's not the exact king james text and so then they might have copied that and you know at, changed a few things added a few things and so it might have taken 10 years for the actual you know the one that people say is the, the gold standard of king james editions the, the pure cambridge edition of 1900 it might have taken that long for it, it might have taken 10 years for it to get on there so but like with the texas receptors they've just started printing and they've just started doing this stuff and so it took um from the complutensian polyglot all the way through to the king james era for for the tr to be i all the issues ironed out and for that text to be perfected it's it's a different technology so when people are oh, where was the bible before 1611 or where's the manuscript that backs up the tr 100 percent? well the one manuscript it's like you know they have these two manuscripts vaticanus and sinaiticus Burgon said it's easier to find a verse where they disagree with them when, when they agree they're so different from each other they shouldn't even be classified as the same family but um yeah, they, they're not looking for one manuscript that backs up their Bible today. It's like that's that's ridiculous to them. But they, they put that limitation on us. Where's it? You know, these stupid um, limitations. It's like, well, we, we've never claimed that a man, one manuscript would, would um, you know, be exactly identical. Um, we, we claim that in, yes, in the manuscripts, if you have a variety of manuscripts and you look at them, you look at these variants, you can come if you are fluent in Greek. If you are fluent in some of the other languages, you might look at Latin commentaries. You might look at other things. There's a three close class of witnesses. So you've got the Greek. Obviously, the Greek overrides everything, but you have the Greek, and then you have the Latin, and then you have the early church writers. So these three close class of witnesses are the three main pillars that the Texas Receptor stands on. So, um, firstly, you know we know about the Greek obviously. Secondly, we're looking at the Latin. We, you know, many people forget that the Latin was huge and the Latin, you know, the comma is like, you know, 95% of the Latin manuscripts, things like that. So people have been reading the Latin. When you look at the Greek, you can go, wow, hang on, the Latin's just a little bit mistranslated there or something's dropped out there or there's a, we've got to tweak this. So the Latin polish, sorry, the Greek polishes the Latin. Sorry. The Latin polishes the Greek, the Greek corrects the Latin, and it's guided by the early church writings. So the early church writings, they were obviously quoting from Bibles. They were talking about words. They were talking about things. And so they had commentaries as well. And these many times contain verbatim words that are scripture, scripture chunks of scripture. And so that, that, that was of great interest to people like Erasmus and Stephanus and Beza. They were looking at these things. They were looking at commentaries. Um, they, were, they were looking at the Latin. They were looking at the Greek. So then when you get to, to Theodore Beza, you're looking outside of the closed class of witnesses. So you've, you've got basically um, Erasmus, the Complutensian polyglot guys. Um, you're looking at um, Stephanus. They're looking mostly at the Greek and the Latin. And the early church writers the closed class of witnesses they're perfecting their text but then to give it an overall polish then um theodore beza he with tremelius and janius so tremelius he was a hebrew guy he done a, um, a syriac bible and then he did a hebrew bible um and him with janius who did an arabic bible they worked with theodore beza and they produced the um the text which was basically the latin bible for uh for about 300 years until it was overthrown um by uh, a corrupt text so this is basically identical to the king james on, on nearly every point if you were to translate the king james into that era latin um there would be it would be very hard to find any differences and so um so obviously he's looking at uh arabic he's looking at um you know different languages they're looking at uh, the the syriac um uh new testament and and so theodore beza he often talked about that because he was friends with tremelius who had done that translation and so that's the type of scholarship that had happened so it had gone through the greek gone through the latin and then they went outside of the closed class of witnesses and started looking at a lot of the translations and how 
things were worded and, and how uh, things were, tr were translated. And so that helped them understand and recognize the text. Um, Kepier in all ages said, uh, Wallace quote, actually I might just, I might put these up. Um, I don't hold to the doctrine of preservation. That doctrine first formulated the Westminster Confession, uh, 1646, has a poor biblical base. Well, I think the thing is half of the verses that they use, probably not half, but a lot of the solid verses they use 1 John 5, 7, um, you know, 1 Timothy 3, 16. Um, they're butchered in the critical text. So, of course, they're going to look back and say, well, these guys didn't have the right Bible. Their view of preservation is that God preserved the manuscripts. But the thing is, they can't even tell us how many manuscripts Erasmus had. James White, you know, he, he'd say six, and then he would say, oh, between six and 12, and then now he's saying 20 manuscripts. Um, Dan Wallace, he's um, said, you know, it was only based on five manuscripts, the Texas Receptus, and then he turns around and says the King James Bible is based upon that, on five manuscripts. <laughs> it's like... How do you get that? You know, it's it's like you're just missing out on Stephanus and Beza and a whole bunch of guys in between. But, you know, whatever, you know. And, and also not looking at the other editions of Erasmus. It's like he did one edition, you know, and that's it. And that, that's that's our narrative, guys. Don't move from it. Erasmus only had half a dozen manuscripts. And it's like, guys, you know, get with the program. But the thing is, our studies on Revelation 16.5, it's been shown by myself, um, by... Jeff Riddle, that um, Theodore Beza did have a manuscript that uh, is unknown to the Academy. It's been unknown to them for like 200 years. And so um, what was that manuscript? So if you can't even tell me what manuscript Theodore Beza had, what chance have you got of telling me what Stephanus had or let alone telling me what Erasmus had? I mean... You know, they're, they're sort of like, oh, what we've got today is, you know, what God's preserved. It's like, well, how do you know that what we've got today, you know, it's like, oh, we've got access to all these manuscripts. Yeah, but most of the time you just regulate it to, to Byzantine and you don't even look at them all. You just look at Vaticanus and Sinaiticus and a few papyri just to back up Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. But then how do you know there wasn't thousands of that? Like, how do you know? Erasmus didn't have access to thousands and thousands of manuscripts when he was in Venice with all these Greek guys there with their manuscripts. He was in Aldous's print house. Aldous was already printing parts of the New Testament. Where did he get that from? Which manuscript was that? You know what I mean? And it's like the, the, these are just things that the, just go over the head of the critical text guy. No, we've got a narrative. We don't let these pesky facts get in the way of a good story. It's a good story. We've stuck with it for, you know, 100 years. We've dethroned the Texas Receptus and shut your mouth, you know, sort of thing. So um, Helge Evanson says, TR is the only text base that is consistent with the doctrine of pres providential preservation, while the critical text view would regard uh, any reading pre-400 dated uh, manuscript as possibly original and it's quite amazing that they had two manuscripts Vaticanus and Sinaiticus that are that at uh, that age apparently and I'll, I'll actually put that up um they had two manuscripts that are of that age but the amazing thing is um they've they differ so much from each other and so how can you have them both being good you know it's like uh, uh, they're both contradicting each other in many places. And so it's very strange. Um, okay. So we looked at Erasmus. So we're about two hours in. And so I'll just put um, the banner back up of StreamYard. So if you want to join us, just type that into your URL. It'll just follow the prompts. And if you've got a, a workable uh, camera, um, it's probably best that you use headphones. If someone jumps in, I'll probably jump on headphones as well. Um, but if you don't, we'll try it. We'll see what happens. But, um, okay, we've got another comment coming in here. 
Oh, yes, so this is Christian. So he kept hearing it all ages, so that's uh, Christian. And so he's uh, written for the Trinitarian Bible Society recently. And so um, I was actually going through some of my PDFs last night that I've got. I've got so many PDFs. Um, and I found uh, the history. There was two PDFs of the history of the Trinitarian Bible Society. And I thought that would be an interesting one to go through and maybe one of Dave Cloud's um, uh, books. I can sort of elaborate on what happened with the meetings of the Trinitarian Bible Society and how they left the Bible Society and basically became the Unitarian Bible Society. And so it's, it's quite interesting. Um, okay, so what am I looking for? I'm looking for... Um, I will look for them in a folder, desktop. Okay. Da -da -da. I think I found it. Yep. So I was looking at this last night. I remember I had it in 2013. I'd saved it and, um, it's an old book, uh, 15, sorry, 1899. And so if you were to search for a hand list of a collection of Bibles, and so there might be more to add to this, but it just goes through um, the history, you know, of the Latin Bible, Greek Bibles, Hebrew Bibles, uh, right up until... You know, that time. And so, yeah, like polyglots, the Antwerp polyglot, um, Paris, you know, polyglot, London polyglot. Um, so it just goes through those. So this is where you can get those rare editions of the TR. And so these are obviously polyglots, so it won't have um, diglots in them. Hebrew and Spanish, Latin in various versions, Latin and French, um so sometimes too you, you you don't realize there's a latin version here and so you can go searching for that and go down that rabbit hole and you'll you'll find there's about 100 um tr greek tr um editions that occurred before the king james so there's quite a lot um okay so you get hebrew bibles bomberg another bomberg um and who's printing this stephanus uh, 1539. I might make that a bit larger for you guys because I'm squinting myself. Yeah, so that's quite interesting. Stephanus, the first Stephen's edition of the Hebrew Bible. So he goes on to print another one. Uh, then the Antwerp, um, Planton, uh, etc. And then the edition of Elias Hutter, the celebrated first edition of Hutter. So, yeah, yeah, very interesting. Um, okay, so we've just got Stephen Avery's just joined us. I'll just add Stephen to the panel. Hey, Stephen. Hello. I'm just going to try and put my headphones on this time. Okay. Yeah. Maybe. I might try an old school pair of headphones in my wire box here. Take me a few minutes to untangle the mess that I've made it. So stay with us, guys. We've got Stephen Avery's just joined us. So we're going to be talking about different editions of the TR. Um, and 
we'll try to keep it on topic but i mean if it does diverge from the topic what i'll do is i'll do a part two um and you know start off from you know where we left off with erasmus and go through stephanus and things like that so i'm just nearly there i've got a whole bunch of wires here my emergency wire box every guy has them and no matter how nicely you wrap them up in a bundle they end up tangled around everything else and i've got this nice pair of headphones that were given to me actually i could plug them in Forget those ones i can plug them in using this cord Sorry about that, guys. Give me one minute. And if anyone else wants to jump on, you want to join, just um, just do it. We'll have some fun. We can talk about whatever you want. I'll plug this in. never tried these before I don't know if it's working so I've just got to check a YouTube clip yep, it's working Okay, so I'll just read a few more of these comments. Um, is the 1894 uh, Scrivener essentially the 1598 Beza? So yeah, very good question. Um, when I first got saved, I was told, um, you know, that Scrivener was sort of like a TR sort of guy and he stood against Westcott and Hort and things like that. Um, but over the years, it just became um it, it just became a bit of a, a story because the more that you study scrivener the more you realize that he is probably um one of the key guys behind the westcott and hort text he was on their committee um he was with them and so uh he basically used and so if you read the introduction to the trinitarian bible society text um this one here I'll just open this a bit bigger. And so if you read the introduction, it basically just says, um, it goes through and it lists about 20 or 30 different TR editions. And then it says, sorry, I'll just try to move that away from my head so it's not scratching. It says uh, the authorised in, uh, version of 1611 follows the text of Beza's 1598 edition as a primary authority. And so Scrivener said that it diverts in um, 190 places. So he talks about that in his original text. Now, if you uh, go to YouTube, uh, to my channel, you can you can see my playlists. So I'm forgetting that you guys are looking at the screen. I've got to show you this. Um, so I've already done, I think it's, yeah, here we are, um, 11 programs. So I've looked at 10 issues of the 190. And so basically we go through um, looking at Scrivener's text and then we look at Beezer's and then we see exactly um, where Scrivener has changed things. And my issue is that Scrivener changed things he didn't really need to change. Um, a lot of these things are not, um, they're not warranted for change. And so I would recommend you 
to get a primer of the document that I have, if you type in 190 and visa, Google, it'll come up first. 190 variations from Scrutiners 1881, Britney Testament. And so it's quite a long document, but I've got the list that Scrivener has of differences and um, also, you know, the verses that he talks about. And so I've, I think I've just got one more to go and I've finished Matthew and we've found that um, none of them are translatable. So I, I've often said that there's about 20 differences. It's about 10% of the 190. So there's 200. So uh, about 20 of them are, are translatable. And so there are some. So basically what you have is the text of Theodore Beza was used by the King James translators. So this is the Theodore Beza text. It was used by the King James translators, but that in the whole entire New Testament, they only amended their text 20 times. And they could have done a parallel Greek Bible, but they never did that. Um, they real they realized that um they were just commissioned to do it in english so they did it in english and then um uh, you know 270 years later uh scrivener he turned around and he did his edition um which was basically the work that the king james translators could have done had they done a parallel bible there would be no difference between the king james movement and the texas receptus movement it would be almost like a parallel you know like um here in Beza's edition, he has a, a whole Latin translation of his own, um, which is quite interesting. So he did a Latin translation. And it's quite interesting that some of the italics, uh, if you go through that, um, yeah, so I sort of just described the whole thing here. But when you go down the page a little bit, you can see the italics are identical to the King James. So it's quite interesting to see where and he's got annotations down the bottom and so um because they were to go and follow the bishop's bible but then um they were to amend it according to the greek and so um anyway that's that hopefully that answers your question so the 1594 edition is technically an independent variety of the Texas receptus um in a way, um, the the fifteen ninety four. So it's actually fifteen ninety four edition is just a, a printed. Um, it's printed without some of the um, revised version issues because it was actually made for Westcott and Hort um, uh, and Ellicott and the guys on the revised committee, and so um, Scrivener was commissioned to do that. So they understood that the Greek text underlying the King James had never really been printed, that um, they'd sort of gotten to the point where they're working on the Greek, working on the Greek, and then the King James guys who came along, and any one of them could have produced their own Greek text. Like had um, Lancelot Andrews done it, they would have accepted it. Had John Boyce done it, they would have accepted it. But they all worked on this text, and so but they did it in English. And so then later on someone was like, look, let's just – marry up all those tiny little places where you know there's a breathing mark here and there there's a word here and there that's different and so they um so scrivener he he was commissioned to do that and tr proponents have gone well that's a pretty good addition let's use that as our main tr so before that people were using the text of the elzevas which was a bit of a mix between stephanus and um Beza, uh sometimes they go back to the 1598 so these were still being printed for years and years and years and years and so i was looking at a um a manuscript the other day of what they called the texas receptus before scrivener and when you go through it's just sort of like it's a text of Beza basically or stephanus was used quite a lot and so um so you would say that the text of scrivener is the underlying greek text that the King James translators never really got around to doing. Okay, but very good question. Very good question. Um, so, yeah, that was the other question that was asked there. Um, okay, so these guys are chatting about the Norwegian. And so, yeah, very interesting topic, the Norwegian. So I'll just 
close that down so because I think that answers your question about the 190 issues. And so we're back here. So I'm just going to try and get down to the um, the Greek. So portions of the Old Testament. Okay, so New Testament. Um, Greeks uh, or Greek Septuagint. Oh, maybe he's talking about Hebrew. Hebrew New Testament. Yeah, without points. Interesting. Um, so the Septuagint, so Kephalos, so with his New Testament, he did an uh, Old Testament as well based on the Septuagint. So it's interesting to see where these editions of the Septuagint are before uh, we get to the King James because that becomes an issue. Um, and John Boyce actually worked on a study Bible with the um, Septuagint um, and annotated Septuagint. So then we look at Greek Testaments, 1516, because the other one is called a polyglot, so it's uh, not in, in this list. Um, so Erasmus, Erasmus, and then we have this one, which I haven't heard of. Um, interesting. So it's the first time in my life that I've ever seen that. Then 1522 and then the Kephalos 1524. The Wolf Bible, I think this was, or that's Kephalos as well. And, oops, I've gone too far. Um, Colonnaeus. 1534, 1535, um, 36, and so Basilier, printed by Froben, then Stephanus's first edition, uh, Stephanus's second, his third, and so uh, very interesting to go through that list. And so, yeah. It's a little bit hard to navigate that um, that there. Okay, um, Stephen, if you want to come back, um, feel free. I'll just jump on Facebook. And I'll just say to Stephen, it's welcome to come back. Maybe he's just getting some headphones or something like that. Oh, yeah. Hey, Stephen, can you hear me? Yep. Very clear. Just my iPad, no headphones, speaking louder. It could have actually been me that was the problem last time. Because I didn't have headphones on. Yeah, uh, iPads are usually pretty clear. Okay. Yeah, so have you uh, followed what we're saying at all, Stephen? With the, I'm just going through uh, some of the lists of uh, printed Greek editions of the New Testament. And we've sort of gone through um, the fall of Constantinople, the printing press, and then we've gone up to Aldus Minutius and how Erasmus worked with him for with, for seven months. He lived with Aldus, and um, and then Erasmus producing his edition and the Complutensian. So we're sort of up to there. Um, I've heard you say a few times about the Complutensian. There's really no proof that Erasmus was uh, racing against the Complutensian. What do you think of that? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. But the big issue, the good issue, 
is that I got a couple of thoughts and a couple of questions. One is that the Complutense and Erasmus confirm each other, totally different sources and largely the same text. That's what's often missed. And the other thing is, let me see if I can figure out my camera here. Okay. The other thing is that there is a theory that the first edition of Erasmus was largely a particular Greek text mm -hmm. and um, it, it was largely a particular Greek text, only mildly uh, updated, which is an interesting theory because it would, you know, how did it get from there to, you know, Beza 5, where you, and Erasmus 5 and then Beza 5, where you have a lot of changes from the Greek. I don't have the answer to it. I'm just throwing the question out. Okay. As for the Scribner 1894, well, really you should call it the Scribner 1881, because that's the same text. I would point out that it's born in iniquity. That's the key thing that it really should not be overstated as some sort of thing. It should be called in 1881 so that it's recognized as a revision text. The text did not change from 1881 to 1895. So it should be called in 1881. And it's born in iniquity because 1881 was, like you said, for the revision. Its goal was to give a cover story to the revision without having to show all of the AV readings in their text, you see? So it was to take it off their text and put it in some other edition that most people won't even look at. And they could say they were, it was a cover story, basically. So I'm not a big fan conceptually of the 1881, and I definitely don't think it should be called the 1895. Scribner was passed by then and he did it in 1881. Okay, that's my thoughts. Yeah, very good. And yeah, but, um, yeah I think um, yeah, the 1894 edition, um, usually that, I think it was just a, it was printed without some of the revised version uh, issues. Um, but definitely what the 1881 was of Scrivener that was commissioned by Ellicott and um, Westcott and Hort, the translation, the, the revisers, they were supposed to put those TR, um, the, the differences between the TR and the Westcott and Hort text, they were supposed to show these in marginal notes in the original text. But to sort of get away with not doing that, they said, well, how about we just create a whole new volume of the Texas Receptus? and we'll show all the differences in that in the Greek. And then if any scholars want to go to that, then they can. And so um, it's 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 a bit of a shame because the, I think if they had all those readings in the margin of the actual text, people would realise how much it diverts from the King James because that would have been in the English. People would have understood it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so they did a, a whole separate um, project, which uh, wasn't the original plan, um, but it was sort of a, an afterthought. But it has produced one thing that I will give um, Scrivener. Now, I, I've looked enough at the Scrivener text. I, I usually just point to uh, Theodore Beezer and just say, look, that was the one that the King James translators used, but they produced their own TR. So this is the the issue of Edward Hills. Now, I'll just bring up the quotation of Edward Hills here. I've got it on the front page of my Texas Receptus um, site. So this is in David Cloud's book. Um, I, actually, I can't remember what, which book it was, but... Uh, anyway, he summarised this where he says, <clears throat> um, Hills also pointed out, so this is David Cloud, he's about to quote Hills. Hills also pointed out that the King James Bible represents a unique form of the received text. And he believed it was this precise form which should be followed. Um, so he, this is Hills. The King James Version ought to be regarded not merely as a translation of the Textus Receptus, 
but also as an independent variety of the Texas Receptus. But what do we do in those few places where the several editions of the Texas Receptus disagree with one another? Which text do we follow? The answer to this question is easy. We are guided by the common faith. Hence, we favour that form of the Texas Receptus upon which, more than any other God, working providentially, has placed the stamp of his approval, namely the King James Version, or more precisely, the Greek text underlying the King James Version. And so this is one of the things where um, the King James Bible has been, like I said earlier, had the King James translators done a parallel of Beza's text and their text and just showed where they amended it in 20 different places. It's such a small amount of places, 20 places. Um, there would be no key difference between the Texas Receptus movement and King James movement because they basically, you know, things, uh, they equal each other. And so they are equal, um, the, the English equals the Greek, the Greek in equals the English. And so we can tell which words were used um, and where they changed from um, Beza because we can just see that in their English translation. And so what I don't have written here on my website and what, what Cloud doesn't actually go on to mention is that when he says it's the Greek text underlying the King James Version, he says that's the text of Scrivener. That sort of answers that where I would say the text of Scrivener is probably the closest that we have, but it's still not 100% the Greek text underlying the King James. There's still a few places here and there where it's like, well, obviously Scrivener made an error here. And if you go through my videos the, the of the 10 issues that I've done already, you can see where some of those things are redundant. Some of those things show uh, Scrivener's lack of scholarship even. And so... Um, what are your thoughts on that, Stephen? Looks like you're having a, a, a nice uh, brekkie there or, or a dinner probably. Yeah, I moved my mic just in case there's noise in the background. No, I agree with you basically. I don't think, you know, I think the whole idea that the Scrivener text is somehow, uh, you know, divine above the King James is total nonsense. You know, first of all, the English has all sorts of Latin expressions and nuances and the flow of the language that probably doesn't come out in the Greek, even if you're a fluent Greek, which nobody is. You know what I mean? So the, the idea that you're going to say that we're not a King James guy, we're a... I think I said 1895 before, but you corrected me, 1894, I guess. Uh, we're Scrivener 1894 because that's the quote backwards underlying reverse thin text that gave us the King James. It's all silly. It's, it's you know, it's it's the the 1894 could be used as a collation text. It might be good for that. Like the Scrivener 1550 is still used as a collation text, but it really has no other purpose except to give you know, confessional bibliology or people who don't want to acknowledge that they're King James, and here I agree with the Contras a little bit, a little way to dance around their, their uh, you know, affirming the King James as the pure and perfect word of God, because they can sort of say whether it's cloud or weight, they, them even more so, or confessional bibs or whatever, they can sort of say, some of them, not all of them, well, you know, the King James is beautiful. It's wonderful. It's the word of God in English. But the true word of God is the 1894 Scrivener. And that doesn't make any sense at all. I'm mocking it in, in, in a friendly way. That's, you know, uh, the 1894 Scrivener should just really be a collation text, uh, a study text for if you wanted to really look up the Greek and see if the King James followed this or that, you know, that, that's it, you know. It doesn't have a lot of significance. Again, it was born in iniquity. It was born as a tool 
of the decrepit revision. That's what, that's, you know, and you can't get away from that. Okay, I'm done. Yeah, I think what you, what you've said, um, obviously there's going to be <clears throat> some confessional guys, um, who would disagree with you, but, um, I personally would agree, uh, I guess in a sense where, um, the Scrivener text. Now I've got an article here. I'm just going to throw it up here. This is by James Snap Jr. And so, um, yeah, he talks about differences in the in the TR editions and things like that, and differences between, um, you know, differences in, in TR editions that he's he thinks are important. But I, I was more interested in the comments. And so Maurice Robinson said here, one correction: Scribner did not retro translate from the KJV to produce his edition of a text, um, presumably underlying the KJV. Rather, the text of Scrivener's edition was established primarily from Beza's 1598, with changes made to that text only when some other pre-1611 printed edition had a reading closer to that of the KJV. In addition, Scrivener supplies, supplied in an appendix a list of places where no existing printed Greek New Testament happened to represent the King James Version reading. Has Scrivener actually retro translated that appendix would not have been necessary um so i was reading through this and i think there's there's a lot of misconceptions on a lot of sides um of the issue but my my main thing would be that um up until scrivener people were using the you know the 1550 say like the london polyglot where that was that became the standard i think in england um the Elzevas was more popular on the continent um, with with people using that, but neither of those um, backed up the uh, King James version a hundred percent. And I think what um, what Hills was saying there, and I think it's interesting that Hills, you know, he's he's one of the main guys from the confessional uh, camp. Um, he's saying that the Greek underlying the the King James version is um, is authoritative, but then he goes on to point to Scrivener to that. Where my position would be, yes, yeah, Scrivener's gotten close in some places. He's actually gone further away in some places. But ultimately, um, if someone was to create a text, they would probably do what Scrivener did, but they would take a, a little bit more time and they would. Um, read carefully the source documentation of how the King James translators did their work um, and how they stuck closely to the text of Theodore Beza and also how the other earlier English translations were translated because sometimes Scrivener is changing something uh, from Beza where actually when you look at the earlier translations in English, they're translated exactly the same way. So there's no translatable difference in many of the things that he's amended so why has he changed it and sometimes he's actually changing it in favor of the westcott and hort text so these things have to be admitted and i guess um you know some people it, it can sort of you know shake them in a sense if they're putting a lot of faith in this then there can be that little leaven there that they're, they're, they're like well can i trust this you know where I would say, look, this is probably a little bit closer. Theodore Beza's is like 20 differences between the King James New Testament and Theodore Beza's. There's like 20 differences. This um, makes it so it gets closer in some places. It gets a little bit further away in some places, but most of it's not translatable. And so, um, but if you really want to go to where the word of God is, is and that's exactly what um what Westcott and Hort and uh Ellicott and Scrivener thought that if you go to the King James and then you go to their source text which was Beza and you amend it according to the King James you'll get what they had and so the King James translators made their own Greek text and so um that that's one of the the hard things about explaining the King James position to people, the King James isn't just a translation. The King James is the final edition of the Texas Receptus as well. 
So that is hard. It's hard to separate those two issues because people usually think, oh, trans how can a translation be a, a fine final uh, representation of a Greek text? Um, but all the words are there. All the words are exact. All the words are, in, I believe, exactly how they would appear in um, in the original. If it's if it was translated absolutely 100% exactly into the Greek and then you compare that to the originals, I believe it's exactly what it would have been written as if Paul was writing it himself. Um, and so that's what Scrivener thought. That's what... Um, Westcott and Hort thought, that's what Ellicott thought, and that's has to be the ultimate conclusion of people who use this text because it is, people understand, like um, James Snaff will say it's a back translation of the King James, which there is some accuracy in that, but there's also some inaccuracy in a sense where if you leave the 1598 of Beza out of that equation, it's basically that text with 20 places amended and so um you're looking when you're looking at the king james you're looking at Beza's text they just amend they basically took their hat off to Beza and said you've done such an excellent job Beza. we're not going to change your text in hundreds of places there's only like 20 little places where we're going to amend it and the scholarship of the king james guys that was superior to Beza. Beza's ceiling became their floor where they Sorry about that. I just lost the internet, but we're back. And so, um, so yeah, so um, Theodore Beza's um, ceiling became the floor for the King James translators. And with some of these, some of the translators were contemporary with Theodore Beza. They helped him on some of his projects. They would go over to... Um, to Geneva, they would be in uh, France debating against Catholics with Beza. And so they knew him personally. They knew his work intimately. So with all the work that he had done, the King James translators just had that served to them on a silver platter. They saw a few bugs here and there. They flicked it off. They saw it needed a little bit of um, salt and pepper on it, and then it was perfected. And so I think the whole argument against you know the king james oh it's an english thing um god can use english god can use the english language to have the words of god there and so um i think that's that's a an important thing that people need to um that they need to consider Yeah, so um, I'm just going to direct this away from Snap's article here and from that one. So we're looking at how uh, Erasmus spent time in... Erasmus spent time with Bombasius. So pa Paolo Bombasio... He actually lived with this guy for 13 months. Now, Bombasius was the main guy who was sending him um, Vaticanus readings. So it's quite interesting that, you know, probably years before he's asking for the Vaticanus readings, he's with Bombasio. Um, they're living together. 
I mean, if you live with someone for a year or more, um, you're going to become you know, intimately acquainted with them. But it just seems like the whole narrative that um, Erasmus didn't see Vaticanus, it seems absurd um, when you look at that, that Bombasio, he ended up being the curator of the, the Vatican Library. He ended up being one of the main guys. Um, there was another guy, Sepol Tiva, I think his name was. And he that, that was sending, you know, some of the finer points and um, right, copying out um, some of the manuscript for Erasmus. But there's just this anecdote that Erasmus never saw that manuscript. And so that they just sort of, because there's an omission in history where he doesn't come out and say, well, I went and saw this manuscript this day. They say, oh, he never saw it. But why wouldn't he have seen it? Why, why? He, would, he was in Rome. He was one of the most famous, um, you know, Greek scholars, Latin scholars. He would have gone to the Vatican Library and looked around. Which is certainly, it's pr probably the library to go to you know, of that era. Why? Uh, apparently, it said door closed where Vaticanus was. He wasn't allowed in. Apparently, you know, there's a, there's a lot of these anecdotes that just constantly come against Erasmus and his scholarship and. Um, yeah, I just I just find it's very hard to get to the bottom of anything Erasmus did without, without um, the um, critical text guys the critical colluding text guys the story. Colluding the story. There's no reason why Erasmus would not be able to get in and see it. That whole idea about hiding the manuscript or making it difficult that came later. That came around 1700. You know, with um, uh, Hug when they got it from Napoleon and. Wetstein and uh, Tischendorf and all that. But I don't think there's any reason at all, knowing the librarian, why, and you're the one who pointed this out, this whole thing that he lived with one of the guys who became a librarian. I don't see any reason at all why he wouldn't have been there and seen it unless he wrote in his letter, I've never seen it. I don't think so. He just mm -hmm. wouldn't remember all the details of the readings. And I forget, it was a Bombazius and Sepulveda I guess it was Bombazius who wrote back with the 365 readings. Is that correct? Uh, one of them did. And, but that doesn't mean he was asked for those readings. The idea was to sort of get a little closer to the Vulgate by giving him a bunch of corruptions. And Erasmus just sloughed it off, and he used one or two of them as minor variant notes and, and sort of laughed at the whole thing. Now, there is one other complication. <clears throat> he sort of hinted that manuscripts were changed in Florence in 1470. And I have that all up on my website, but that's all a little bit fuzzy. Was he really claiming that? Or was he just saying that, you know, how were they Latinized? But it doesn't really matter that much, except for historical interest. The manuscript would have been rejected by Erasmus if he thought it was fourth century, you know? It wouldn't matter. Uh, but he did have another theory that certain manuscripts had been Latinized at 14, after the 1470 Council of Florence. And I think you pointed out that the first time Vaticanus, no, somebody else pointed out, shows up is around 1475, you know. But that doesn't mean it's not a thousand years old, but it doesn't mean it is a thousand years old. There's a lot of people used to think that Vaticanus was AD 600 to 800, before 1881, you know? Uh, so there was some people who said 4th century, but others said 6th century. And a couple of people pointed out that you would never know. There's nothing to really prevent it from being 1000 AD, just a copy of an old manuscript, you know? So there's a lot of myths about Vaticanus. And there's also this whole thing that it looks washed out. Nobody, you know, anyway, I'll stop there. Go ahead. Yeah, very interesting. I think it was the um, the last edition of Erasmus in his uh, 1535 where he said that he thinks it's a back translation from the Latin. And so, which is quite interesting because that's an accusation that people use against Erasmus with the last uh, six verses of um, of Revelation. And so that's one of the um, topics that I looked into. I've done a, a couple of videos on that. In, it's in one of the playlists. Um, and 
it's it's quite interesting. I've sort of come to the conclusion that Delich and uh, Tregellis, that they have looked at this manuscript and it has Reuchlin written on the front of this manuscript. It has um, a signature that has been, um, you know, a handwriting specialists have said that it's Reuchlin's writing um, on the manuscript. But perhaps he had two, three, four of these manuscripts that were the same, that were a commentary. Perhaps this one, it wasn't odd for a, the final page of something to be fallen off or to be destroyed or to be ripped out or something like that. And so um, Erasmus, in his annotations, he clearly talks about verse 19 of chapter 22 in Revelation and how um, he spotted homoeteiton where it says uh, the book of life. And he said he checked with other Greek manuscripts, plural. And um, so he's talking about the final, or, or it, he's talking about the minute little details of verse 19 there. But how could he actually do that if from verse 16 to verse 22 were missing? And so that's why... Delich just came up with this idea that oh, Erasmus just was just a liar. He just made up all these all these uh, issues that never really happened because he never had those words. He back translated it from the Latin, and it just seems so strange and so preposterous. Uh, there's been so many accusations against Erasmus and so many uh, anecdotes made up about him that I, I'm I'm almost convinced that. People need to reevaluate whether that manuscript that Delich found was actually the manuscript that Erasmus had, or perhaps it was tampered with. Um, and so, I, I would, I wouldn't put that past people who were trying to dethrone the Texas Receptus because it was Delich's work that was one of the key elements that people said well erasmus he's made all these mistakes oh he only had one manuscript it just became this um flurry of anecdotes about erasmus and revelation that st are still around today people still just they stare me in the eye and say erasmus only had one manuscript and when i show them in in erasmus's writings that no he said he had other man greek manuscripts plural and i can even show it in um jan kranz's work and and others that they just sort of go vague like well don't you understand that erasmus is a liar he's been proven by delich to be a liar because of this manuscript and um i think this is something that needs to be looked into but um we'll probably do a whole program on that one because it was sean cheatham uh he joined me uh, a few weeks back and he said that would be a topic that he wants to um wants to talk about in depth is the last uh six verses of revelation so i think that'd be good um to go through that and i've, I've written quite a bit on that uh, on my website i might just pull the page up actually so if you go to um revelation 22 and <clears throat> down to uh, verse 19 got a little um, I didn't want many people reading this article because I hadn't really come to any conclusions but then Timothy Berg found it and was sort of grilling me about some of the content and so I had to spend a bit of time on it cleaning it up because he was posting it everywhere and so um, so yeah the last six verses of Revelation and so this article goes through quite a lot of info um, so erasmus is pressed for time and so rushed through the text of revelation erasmus did not have a single manuscript with the complete book of revelation erasmus produced a greek text of the last six verses based on the latin vulgate the latin was more important to erasmus than the greek erasmus had lost a bet to include the comiohani in the text Erasmus had a low view of the book of Revelation. So these are all anecdotes that are, are floating around at the moment. And James White seems to parrot most of them. Um, but yeah, so um, 
this article just goes through a bit of a timeline and he actually said that um at the end of the book i found some of the some words in our ver versions which were lacking in the greek copies plural um but we added them from the latin so he's talking about when he saw homo italiaton in 1516 this doesn't appear in any of his other editions it's taken out and so i've got screenshots of all the issues there and then uh he's answered edward lee's annotations edward lee was grilling him about certain things about a back translation from the latin and so he talks about that in depth um and then yeah so it's got a quite a i've got quite a lot of information there and the translation from german into english by tregellis of delich's work so delich was the one who found um the codex uh Reuchlin's codex and said it was the only one that erasmus used tregellis translated that and so i've got um tregellis's work there so that can be looked at um what scrivener says about certain things hoskia a bunch of others and how young Kranz sort of translates that but then i'm in the middle of a project of comparing all the greek texts so we can see where things were actually definitely changed um and so yeah on some of them I, i've only gone so far as you know the middle of verse 17 because it takes quite a long time to go through all this but eventually i'll have all that lined up so we can compare all the editions of you know the tr editions right down to the complutensi polyglot so th this is an interesting article i usually when i point people to this article i usually say use a bit of caution because um but it does it's a bit like a wikipedia style thing where when if you, if you just go through and just start studying um some of these issues and go down the rabbit trails of where they're leading you you can come up with some interesting uh conclusions and so um okay i'm not sure why it's not taking me there anyway this used to just take me to a an article of the great bible text fraud um oh yeah here we are the myth of erasmus is back translating so I would recommend people read through that if they're interested in the whole concept of Erasmus back tra translating from Latin and how it seems to be a contradiction. If he was just going to back translate from the Latin, why didn't he just do that at 1 John 5 7? He could have just done that. But um, yeah, so it's, it's an interesting uh, article to read through. And I know Chris Thomas has uh, got a link to that on his site as well. And it goes through uh, Delich and the other guys who uh, claim that they've found Erasmus's only uh, text of the apocalypse that that Erasmus used. Um, but I think on my on my page, it's quite clear that Erasmus used more than one manuscript. He he used many manuscripts. He actually says plural Greek copies, apart from the one that he's looking at. So. Um, now Thomas Holland, he wrote about it, uh, Revelation twenty two nineteen. He did an, an okay job, but he made a few mistakes with looking at um, some of the works of Erasmus, and so Jan Kranz wrote a critique on that, which I would agree with most of Jan Kranz's critique of Holland on those issues. But when it comes down to um, the main issue of Erasmus only using one text uh, and all those other anecdotes that um, that have appeared about Erasmus, I think, Erasmus, I think. Um, 
I think he's clutching at straws. I think he's clutching at straws. Nick, Franz has a two or three major deficiencies in that article. I mean, it's obviously that he takes apart Harland a little bit. Okay, fair enough. But, number one, he never mentions the early church writers. I don't think they're in the in the uh, uh, article at all. And oftentimes they're, especially in Revelation, but in any text, they're key. You know, what does Andreas' commentary say? Stuff like that. And the other thing was, he never discusses how the text changed from Erasmus 1 to 5 to Stephanus to Beza, you know? He just left that out of the, the paper. So he was targeting the paper to be an attack on Holland to contradict a few things that Holland said. And, you know, that's his right. But as an overall view of the ending of Revelation, his paper was grossly deficient. And in fact, when I discussed it with him on a a wed discussion, I actually asked him if he believed in any sort of preservation, and he laughed basically, said, you know, no, <laughs> like that. I have that quote, you know. So, but even putting that aside, in terms of scholarship for the last verses, Kranz's article is helpful, but it really misses key points. Again, nothing about the early church writers and what they had on each variant, nothing really on uh, I don't think he really goes into the Latin support for 2219, you know, or maybe other places, not properly anyway. We don't even know if Revelation was written in Greek, by the way. The, the theory that it might be a translation from Hebrew or Aramaic into Greek and Latin, it's not a bad theory. And it also explained, the Hebraicisms explain why Revelation is the one book that is accused of significant solecisms, other than First John 5, 7, First Timothy 3, 16, you know, which is just corruptions in the modern version. But even, now a lot of those solecisms are in fact um, modern version corruptions, Westcott Hort only, but not all of them, those supposed solecisms. So I think it's important to consider with a very different transmission history, very little knowledge until about the fourth century, and all sorts of Hebraicisms in it, like you point out with Revelation 16.5, is that correct? With all sorts of Hebraicisms in it, that it may be a translation from a, a you know, an inspired translation from a, into Greek and Latin from a Hebrew or Aramaic source. Remember that every uh, critical text text crit is has blinders on about all the books are in Greek. That's not true. You know? It's very you know, it's very likely that Mark was not only in Greek. It's very likely that Revelation was not. There was a Matthew edition that was different, but it wasn't the one, et cetera, et cetera. Hebrews has its own dual language, Hebrew and Greek uh, source, according to Eusebius, you know, where Luke, I believe it was, uh, took Paul's Hebrew and made it into good Greek, stuff like that. So they are running under uh, Greek onlyism, which really is a ridiculous theory because, uh, you know, it's a theory. Let's put that. It's not a ridiculous theory, it's a weak theory. Okay, I'll stop. Yes, yeah, some very interesting points. And I think, um, you know, a lot of people wouldn't even flinch if you said, you know, um, the book of Matthew was probably written in Hebrew and then translated into the Greek. Um, people would just say, yeah, that that's fine. Um, and so when you look at um, uh, Revelation, um, I guess in a sense where there would have been a time when um, God finalised um, what was written in a, in a certain book. And so perhaps there was a draft done in Hebrew. Um, some of the solecisms, um, like you were saying about the, uh, the critical text guys or the critical text itself, that most of the solecisms appear in the critical text. But um, they usually have to do with things like, say they say, um, say Revelation 1-4 when it says, 
you know, from the seven spirits. Um, uh, now it says uh, from God and the one which was and is and is to come. And so there's a solecism there, but only if you don't understand that uh, which was and is and is to come is a name. The whole entire, those are, all those words are a name of the one which was and is and is to come. That's an entire name. And so when you recognize that it's nominative, it's a name, the solecism disappears. But when you're just looking at each individual word, you're looking at the one which was and is and is to come. When you're going through that, it looks like it's a solecism. And so many times it's because these guys can't really read Greek sufficiently and they're not scholars like Theodore Beezer or Stephanus or Erasmus and and so they're doing schoolboy Greek and they're just going oh the, this doesn't add up here where they're not really they're not doing algebra they're just doing you know grade one and grade two one plus one equals two oh that doesn't fit that must be a mistake in the Greek but um, not understanding the complexity of the Greek language that sometimes a whole cluster of words can be a noun phrase and so um they do that through the through everywhere that um the triadic declaration appears they say oh there's a solecism there there's a greek error there but that's because they're not recognizing that that's the expanded name of jehovah but with um the whole concept of it being uh a hebrew document uh, John was a Hebrew speaking person and whenever God says curios or whenever Jesus says curios or a heavenly being like an angel or, or the 24 elders or whenever they say um, curios th that that obviously is Lord and that's one of the reasons why we've got no problem with having Lord in all capitals in the King James because that the you know, Greek writers did that. They didn't see any reason to have Jehovah um, brought across. They just wrote Lord, so that, that's equivalent. But any time a heavenly being said that, um, they that would be equivalent to Jehovah, and they said which was and is and is to come. And the final one they said which was and is and shall be. And so um, that to me is showing that they the angels were speaking Hebrew. So there's a whole concept called uh, eugenics. Uh, sorry, not eugenics, Edenics. <laughs> eugenics is what Hitler did. But um, eugenics is the study of the original language of the Bible. And so um, believing that Adam and Eve spoke Hebrew, that God spoke Hebrew to them, that Hebrew is a special language that God has used. He uses it in heaven. Um, and he's used that throughout the ages. And when we go all go to heaven, we're all going to be speaking that language. And so uh, there are people who believe different variations of that. But I can understand that God would have probably had the angels at least speak to John in Hebrew. Um, now, if if Stephen went to heaven, um, if you were living back then and you went to went to or you had a vision um, and were caught up in all this sort of stuff, you probably would have gotten spoken to in English because you would understand that better. And so perhaps it was just that John had experienced everything in Hebrew. And then when he came back, he's speaking it out and people are writing it down in Greek. Um, but it's a very interesting concept. And um, it's, yeah, for someone who enjoys languages and Hebrew and Greek and things like that, it, it's quite an interesting concept. So if anyone um, anyone out there wants to join uh, Stephen and myself, if you just type this into your URL, you can jump on, you can ask us questions. Uh, we'll talk about anything that's uh, King James Version related, Texas Receptus related. Um, and so we've sort of gone through the history of the, the TR. I went through and basically got to sort of Erasmus and then, you know, we're, we're sort of sidetracking here, but... Um, that's fine. I don't mind sidetracking and just going off to wherever it leads us. Um, but yeah, so this is the article 
by Jan Kranz. And so some of these articles are helpful in a sense where he will have the source documentation. One thing I found with Jan Kranz, uh, and I actually wrote quite extensively on this on my, on my site, is that he translates differently to Erica Rummel. And so um, you can see these two bits here are basically the same uh, bit of Latin. And look at just on the last sentence, so I've got it emboldened and underlined there. It says, this is him, Jan Kran, so he's claiming that Erasmus said this. The style of this book is very simple and its contents are mostly narrative, let alone the fact that its author has long since been unknown. So John, uh, you know, Eras Erasmus is basically saying, we, we don't know who wrote Revelation. Finally, this place is only the ending of the book. Okay. So you get this impression that, you know, Erasmus is like, oh, well, we don't even know who wrote Revelation and it's just the end of the book, you know, so who cares? Where Erica Rummel, this is in the 1980s, she wrote, the language of this book is very simple and the content has mostly a historical sense, not to mention the authorship was once uncertain. So the Greeks, they thought that Revelation, that they didn't think that John had written it. And so they placed some doubt over the book of Revelation and the authorship of it, not Erasmus. And so the authorship was once uncertain. So that's Erasmus saying that by Erica Rummel. But when you look at Jan Kranz, he's got the spin on it. The author has long since been unknown. So we don't know who wrote it. So one makes Erasmus not believe that John wrote it. The other one makes Erica Rummel's saying Erasmus um, is claiming that the author was once uncertain. And then finally, this passage is merely the conclusion of the work. And so um you can see there that um that Kranz has a bias he has a he's translating his latin with bias there so when you read you know um beyond what is written or read his articles many times you find uh he has his own latin translation when you find erica rummel's translation of it it's different and he's translating with the critical text bias now erica rummel also seems to have a critical text um, position, um, but not as hostile. I just find uh, Kranz is quite um, bold in the way that he he does things. And so there was this uh, word olim that he, um, so he has in that article that I showed Erasmus and uh, Revelation 22.19, he has a footnote about that. And he has, um, at the end of Revelation, I added some words to the book on the basis of the Latin ones, translation Erica Rummel. And so in this, this is Kranz in, a, in his footnote. Instead of the authorship was once uncertain, I would prefer another nuance of volume. The authorship has long since been uncertain. So he's just putting his own spin on it because of this word olim, the Latin word. And so I've got the um, translation of Olam there in the Latin dictionary. So it's 1890, so it's not bias. So at that time, some time ago, once upon a time, once formerly of old. And so you, it's pretty hard to read into that. Has you know, The authorship has long since been uncertain. You would more so say in former times it was uncertain. Um, which is Erica Rummel reading. And so that was just one, it's it's just showing just one example of bias with Jan Kranz there. And so um, I've just got a comment here. I'll just check it. Interesting or completely hypothetical? Okay. I think... Um, so that's Christian writing there. I think he's talking about the book of Revelation, whether it's um, written in uh, Hebrew or not. But yeah, anyway, so that's just one of the issues that you know we're facing with the Revelation, um, uh, last six verses of, of Revelation. So that's a, another topic. Uh, 
Um, so that's quite interesting. There is an interesting YouTube video to watch on this topic as well, which is an interview with Jan Kranz. And so it gives you exactly what Jan Kranz thinks about it. So basically, he's doing an academic uh, presentation there. So uh, it looks like Stephen's just sort of dropped out for a sec. He might have just gone off to do something. But um, yeah, I recommend anyone watch this, Erasmus and the uh, Greek Text of Revelation. It's a, it's a very good, um, interesting video to watch. Um, uh, Jan Kranz, uh, he's obviously very adamant to defend Delich and Tregellis on this issue. But um, I'm seeing lots of holes in this issue. And so... Uh, this is something that I'm going to sort of uh, tackle and and um, and bring down to the mat and fight this out. So, kept pure in all ages says interesting or completely hypothetical. Um, yeah, well, I guess you know some things are uh, hypothetical um, in a sense where. Um, yeah, well, I guess, you know, I mean, I'm, if someone was to prove to me that the whole entire New Testament was written in Greek, okay, okay you know, but um, I guess there are people on all sides of the fence, in TR or critical text, or who, um, who do think that Matthew was drafted in, in Hebrew. Um, and so I guess what I was saying was, revelation like um there could have been a draft in hebrew or you know perhaps um, john came back wrote that out and then it's like well none of these guys in these greek churches who are going to send it to because he had to send the seven letters off to you know off to those churches um the seven churches they wouldn't have understood it if it, if it was in hebrew so he probably just worked on it uh, on another uh text and so but um but then we can get into that Bart Ehrman area of speculation. Whoops, sorry. Sorry, is it, Stephen? Um, then we're looking at the area of speculation, which sort of like Bart Ehrman loves to talk about, which is like, you know, oh, Peter, he was just a, a poor fisherman. Uh, he couldn't have written Second Peter because uh, he didn't no old testament literature he wasn't educated how did he write this beautiful greek letter um when he didn't really know greek and all this sort of stuff and so um these things are hotly contested issues at the moment and a lot of people are going through looking at who the authors of the new testament were um you know looking at like stephen said um paul having the influence on luke uh, peter having the influence on on Mark, um, Matthew being a first-hand eyewitness, uh, John, first-hand eyewitness. Um, and so going through these things is, is important. And I guess uh, I've got to understand more and more about those things. And so um, so kept here in all ages says, uh, not negotiable. The Old Testament was immediately inspired in Hebrew, Aramaic, and the New Testament was immediately inspired in Greek. Yeah, and I understand that where i think the final product that was immediately inspired would have been the uh, the greek but what i'm saying is to get there john was most probably talking to god in his native hebrew language and so he could have came back written a draft and then that could have been used as a, to work towards a final product in greek and so, and so um, I, wouldn't um, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with what you're saying, what you're saying there. there. I think I, I can think squeeze my narrative into, into that, that, that and it that would suit fine. fine.
Okay, so just add a private chat. I'll throw this article up. I might get I might you just, get to, just mute to mute yourself, yourself there, there Stephen, Stephen, just, just while, while I'm chatting, because I get a bit of feedback. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so the claim of grammatical errors in Revelation, Hebrew or Aramaic autograph. Um, so the Texas Receptus Academy, Will Kinney. Um, okay, so we're, someone asked about the grammatical errors in Greek. Are there grammatical errors in the Greek text of Revelation? A fellow King James Bible believer writes, Hey, Will Kinney, I encountered some online, someone online who claims that the grammar of Revelation is corrupt. He gave these 10 examples uh, in addition to the evidence for uh, Semitic grammar embedded in the, New, in the Greek New Testament. The fact that serious grammatical errors are found in the Greek New Testament books may be added. Speaking of the Greek of Revelation, Charles Akatatori uh, states that it... Uh, swarms with major offences against Greek grammar. He calls it linguistic anarchy. He says the grammatical monstrosities of this book in their number and variety, and especially in their startling character, stand alone in the history of literature. <laughs> okay, and so here we have Tori. So I used to have a few of Tori's books, but I just found they were pretty dry. Um, okay, so we've got a few links there we can go to. Yeah, so Revelation 1.4, that's exactly what I was saying. The, the grace to you, peace from he who is and was and is to come. So, oh, it's all nominative case. So why is all that? Because um, who is and was and is to come is a noun phrase. And so uh, once you understand that, see, even um, if I was to, actually, it's holding up my computer here. But if you just go to a even a basic Strong's Concordance, this whole thing is a noun phrase. I think I've got this information on Revelation 16.5. <clears throat> Revelation 16.5. By the way, my purpose there is simply to show the scholarship of the whole question, which would normally be ignored today by the textual critics. I'm not really taking a position that it was or was not written in Hebrew and Aramaic, but I'm just showing that there's some very good scholarship that makes that, that takes that position. I just want to make that clear. Okay. So I'm just going to put um, Kip here in all ages is throwing up his objections to the Hebrew Aramaic. And so I guess um, that's where I guess uh, someone could open the door to uh, Aramaic primacy. I definitely wouldn't take that position. No, uh, no, no, no. This has nothing to do with Aramaic primacy. In, uh, that's a really cockamamie offshoot but that says that that the Peshitta is somehow the true original which makes no sense so I would not I would always separate this from Aramaic primacy if something I mean you've got Aramaicisms in the New Testament and, and Hebraicisms that doesn't make it primacy now in let me give Mark as a quick example there's a Mark does not read like an inspired like a an autographic Greek text. It reads as either an Aramaic text or, uh, translated to Greek or a Latin text translated to Greek. Uh, there's certain verb consecutives and different things. I've talked to people who know Latin. They look at Mark and they say, it's my style of Latin. You know, I mean, uh, it looked, now that doesn't mean that the, the, the first time you can still say that it was inspired in Greek, but if the Westminster Confession is insisting that the original autograph could not have been two editions or a, a Greek or Latin dialect or a Latin translate, it's uh, Hoskier touched on all this as well as a lot of other people. 
then I will move away from the Westminster Confession. But it doesn't exactly say that. But if it did, I, I don't think we should consider that as scripture, even if you're a Reformation bibliolo uh, bibliologist, confessional Reformation, confessional bibliologist, because uh, I don't think they would have insisted on that push come to shove. I think they were giving a simple shorthand. You know, I think people like John Owen probably would have been very considerate of whether there might have been a Hebrews in Hebrew at some time, you know. Okay, I'll stop. But I just want to say, if you want to take that position, that's fine. But it's not a scriptural position that the first writing had to be in Greek. And historically, it looks a little difficult. And logically, it looks a little difficult. It looks difficult in Revelation. It looks more difficult in Mark. It's a little bit involved in Matthew and Hebrews. But Mark is, a, is the key test. So why do we insist that Mark could not have had two different editions, that then were correlated one to another into, into, a, into a Erasmus? But even there, you have Andreas's commentary, which, which came later, which is largely a TR Greek. In fact, somebody pointed that out. I think I passed that on to you, that somebody pointed out that the I think it was the Andreas commentary was much closer to the TR than is the critical text. Okay, I'll stop there. In Revelation. So anyway, Christian, I'm not uh, I'm not saying you don't have every right to have that view, uh, but it's not it's it's a confessional view on a particular confession. It's not from a straight biblical uh, claim. Okay, that's possible. You know. Are you talking about those words or the whole book? Okay. All right. But that's non negotiable to the to those who hold the Westminster Confession as equivalent to Bible. I don't. So so for me it's very fluid. Of course, I get some of the confessional bibliology people don't like me very much because I'm not, you know, an Athanasian Creed, Trinitarian, whatever. So, and I'm, you know, but I love the Reformation and I love the direction that it went, but I can't take a particular creed and say that it's non-negotiable. Yeah. Yeah. So I might so just get you to meet your mic there, Chris Stephen. So yeah, I should have said a particular confession because we're talking about a confession rather than a creed. Okay, go ahead. Say that again, Nick. Uh, I might just uh, get might you just to get mute your mic mute just for a second. For a second. Oh yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, sorry. It just comes. It comes through. Uh, my voice comes through double, and it's really hard to concentrate when I'm um, hearing double. But um. Yeah, so I guess, you know, like I said earlier, um, I, I usually try to keep everything um, pretty neutral when it comes to the TR, uh, KJV issues and just sort of look at, you know, the facts on the ground and things like that. Um, and like I, I was, um, yeah, so we're going to get guys from confessional bibliology, um, Calvinist background, reform background, and we're going to get people from all, all sorts of different backgrounds. And so... Um, I think the thing is, if we see this issue as just factual, there's we can all agree on a mathematical sum, one plus one equals two. And so I think that's the common bond that brings us together. Um, there's probably, you know, 20 other things that we could all debate on um, when we're looking at, you know, eschatology and, you know, um, Diff, a whole different other a bunch of other uh, doctrines we could probably you know have as many debates as James White's having but um we I guess we're you know we're coming to this text and we're just sort of we're looking at it and go okay this is the problem here this is the problem there but it's good to air these things because I think by airing them people know where they stand and some people don't 
really know the difference what's the difference between being confessional and not confessional and and so um yeah these are things that i discuss on the tr academy and um you know often times i'd have someone like jonathan sheffield or so so what you're an anglican guy so what's your what do you think you know what are you like calvinist or what, what's your position and and then um because there's so many different positions that people come from and, and obviously a lot of people come from the westminster confession of faith um, i usually just sort of say with the westminster confession there's certain things in the confession that i don't agree with that you know with with um when it comes to baptism of babies and things like that and so i i would shy away from those things and most people do and so we sort of see that there are places where people are willing to yield and say yeah okay well i I don't agree with this and they'll they'll discuss those things out or whatever um but at the end of the day we're um yeah we're we're just throwing up ideas some people are going to have ideas which great against others um and so but i think it's great that we talk them out and um and think about these things so i'll just throw up a few more of these um so hudson uh, hd77 said hey guys uh question how would church fathers have coined uh the use of the word trinity without knowledge of one job five seven and i think it's very hard for them not to have used one john five seven because the word trinity sort of um it's in the greek it's uh i'll just i'll just type it in here triada and so it's a triad and so when you go to uh, 1 john 5 7 uh, you can see the type of wording that's there uh, 1 john 5 <clears throat> 5 7 <clears throat> It's triata, and then we look at trace here. And so it's talking about the three, the three. And so um, the Trinity is just the three. And so, but I understand that the word Trinity wasn't used by Paul. I can understand that. And um, obviously, you know, with, with Stephen, you know, wherever Stephen goes, um, uh, the confessional guys usually hold him to task with you know Trinitarian issues and things like that. Um, but... uh, I will agree that, uh, and this that without First John five seven, they probably would not have developed uh, even a fundamental two fifty A D Trinity doctrine. That it was there, we know it was there in uh, Cyprian at that time. So I'm in agreement with the with the question, uh, even even without being a particularly a Trinitarian in the overt sense. But the question is very good, and the Trinity doctrine uh, was largely util. Uh, not real. I mean, it was sort of the undercurrent of it was the Heavenly Witnesses verse. I would I would definitely agree with that. And the two people who really probably got close to that only one in english is charles forster f-o-r-s-t-e-r he uh really sort of said that he said look all of this early church language would not have developed without the heavenly witnesses before him franz knittel in no i think it's in english i think it's translated no i'm not sure. yeah but uh, i forget but he was taking the same type of position and then and of course there's about 25 very strong latin writings that have not been translated so there might be more but those gentlemen really showed uh that the language of the creeds um nicaea and beyond was built on first john 5 7. now i don't know if you know this but eusebius actually quoted against the three in one not against the whole verse, but against the 301 as being too Sibelian. So you have tensions on both sides. In fact, 
uh, Jerome has a similar quote in, in one of his writings where in addition to the Vulgate prologue, where he's strongly defending the heavenly witnesses verse, there's another quote where he says that the 301 creates a lot of uh, dissension. I think it's Psalm 91, but I, I have it on my website. And so there's a lot of historical, the ideas that the conflicting ideas that the heavenly witnesses was suppressed because it was too sabellian or oneness as some might call it or what you know you know the whole deal uh makes some sense and also the fact that the heavenly witnesses was the undercurrent of the trinity formulations also makes sense we'll call that a constructive dissonance and i'll stop there Yeah, very interesting. And um, I, I found that place. This is um, Charles Foster's book. And uh, it says he derives uh, his corruption of the doctrine of the Trinity from the first verse of John's gospel. And in this connection, so introduces Tria as to justify the belief that he derived the term from hot trios in 1 John 5, 7, um, as he takes his Gnostic Trinity from St. John's gospel uh, it is only natural that he should take his title for it from the epistle. Okay, so that's um, quoting Nittle there, I think, somewhere. But yeah, the, if you go to, uh, if you just type in um, Foster, I, I found that on, on a link on my webpage. He, he's got quite a lot dealing with that. With that. I'm, not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if what I just read deals with that, but go for it. Yeah, I even found today that one of the contras had somehow HTML'd a lot of Foster's Greek. I don't know how much. Uh, and if somebody wants to work with some of his quotes, you've already, that save, would save you a lot of time because you'd already have it in uh, HTML ready for interpretation, English translation. That's the weakness with Foster is he doesn't give enough uh, in a translation of his little Greek snippets, you know, so he leaves you in the lurch if you're not a Greek geek. Yeah, definitely interesting. And so we just had another comment uh, from Christian. He said, uh, can you show me Hebrew or Aramaic manuscript of Mark or Hebrews? Um, it's interesting that I, I debated Stephen Boyce uh, quite a while back, um, probably about two years ago, and he's been doing programs on the authorship of, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who who wrote the Gospels, and just going through early church writers, and a lot of it I would just agree with in a sense, where it's just common, you know, bog standard sort of uh, bibliology and understanding. Um, but I think the, uh, the other day you were pointing out um, in Luke, I know this doesn't answer the Aramaic or um, Hebrew question, but you were pointing out in Luke, uh, Stephen, about uh, Theophilus and who he was. And so that was quite interesting. Can you just share a little bit on that? Yeah, that, and this is actually very beautiful because it ties in with the whole basic truth that the New Testament was written early the Gospels by 50 AD or so, the uh, Epistles before 70, and probably Revelation before 70. Okay, Theophilus was the Jewish high priest in 40, 41 AD when he was most excellent because he was the high priest at that time. And Luke was dedicating his book almost definitely to that Theophilus. I mean, it really... Uh, the first person in modern times to discuss this was in the 1700s, uh, Hayes, I think, H-A-S-C. And it was actually picked up by Michaelis, who was the super-duper scholar of the 1700s. And then, and then it was lost for 250 years to 10, I think. And it was picked up by a guy named Richard Anderson, who did a little paper on it in 1995. And the idea is very simple. He dedicated the first book of Luke 
at 41 AD to Theophilus. And the second book was still dedicated to Theophilus, but he was no longer most excellent. His son was on the high priest at that time, which is about 60 AD. And that was the book of Acts, which we know is dated to 60, 62 AD. So Theophilus, now people get surprised. Why did the Jewish high priest um, have a Greek name like Theophilus? And the answer is, it is as it is. That was his name. It's that way from Josephus. Josephus says his name is Theophilus. And um, why people don't want to accept that? Because it makes for an early New Testament. And they want to believe the New Testament is 80 AD or, you know, post 70 or at the early, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it has gotten some good traction. If you go on my website and you go to the page, just put in search for Theophilus, you know, in the search bar, in the title, and you get right to the pages, a couple of pages maybe. And you get a lot of background as to how this developed. But this is one of the things that's very beautiful. And, and I would say close to 100% true. Uh, you know, you can contest it. There's a couple of questions that come up. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm saying that this is, if I talk to you about an Aramaic Hebrew uh, revelation, Aramaic, I'm just giving you a theory, okay? I'm not saying that I accept it or that it's definitely true or even likely true. It's just very possibly true. But if I tell you about Theophilus being the target, uh, oh, also Acts 6, 6, 7, that a great company of priests were came to faith, uh, that probably included Luke. There's another book by another gentleman called Luke the Priest. How did he know about the courses of Abathar? How did he know all that? How did he know about Simeon and Anna and all the details there? This was because he was there. He was in the he was a priest in the temple. I'm not saying that absolutely definite, but it makes a lot of sense. And then you can feel the irony when he writes to Theophilus that a great multitude of priests came to faith. And and oh, that included you, Luke. You know, it's like he was sort of like giving him a nudge, you know, without saying his own name. So Luke was probably a Jewish priest. Not, oh, the other Luke was, was called a, a physician to differentiate himself from the partner Luke. You know, that's why he was, that was a different Luke called the physician so that he wasn't confused with Luke who wrote the New Testament, which as you probably know, was called scripture, excuse me, in 1 Timothy 5.18. Uh, with the one with the oxen, uh, et cetera, that Luke's uh, text was called scripture by Paul in Timothy. So by 60 AD, Luke's 41 AD writing was accepted as gospel scripture. So that also fits with the idea of Theophilus and early dating the New Testament. It's not definite that Luke was the earliest, although, you know, uh, it's possible that Matthew edition pre preceded it, but Luke was definitely before Mark. And if you look at my website, I, I sort of borrowed that was, and changed it from a skeptic, a nice guy, who did a great study showing that Mark depended on Luke. And then I added a little bit to it. So Luke had to precede Mark, probably preceded John, but we don't really know between Luke and Matthew. Okay, you know, it's hard to tell. That's it. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll move. Lila Tov. Uh, Lila Tov. <laughs> Sorry, I was I muted myself. So I've just muted you there, Stephen. Um, so, yeah, uh, Christian had to go to bed. So that's fine. Um, but yeah, it's a very interesting topic and probably one that's going to be um, coming out more and more. The more that I read Bart Ehrman's material, the more that I see that he is he uses uh, misconceptions about this type of thing over and over to uh, try and make out that um, the texts of the New Testament were forgeries, uh, that, you know, Peter, he, he was just an average fisherman. How could have he had written... Um, 
you know the the Greek that's in uh, first and second Peter. I mean, obviously these guys were very good in in their native Hebrew, and hanging around with Jesus for for years, they wouldn't have learnt from the academy, but they would have learnt straight from Jesus, who's God in the flesh. Um, they would have had a very good education um, for, of three years of reading the scriptures and memorizing things. And and so even though they were seen as unlearned um, by the academy because they probably just didn't know all the all the fluff a, around the word of God, um, they knew the substance of the word of God and they knew the, the true meaning of, of the word of God. And so they saw that they were unlearned and ignorant men, but they actually were a lot more learned than um, the people who were in front of them because they'd been, they recognized they'd, they'd been with Jesus. And so, um, but Bart Ehrman sort of makes out that Peter is, you know, this ignorant buffoon, but um, it takes away the whole concept of an amenuensis where you dictate something and someone transcribes it. And so obviously, unless these guys uh, learnt Greek, perhaps they did know Greek, perhaps they did know Latin. I mean, we know that Pilate, he put um, Hebrew, Greek and Latin on the um, on the post above uh, the cross that, that showed that he was the king of the Jews. Now, that's not in the critical text, of course, but it's in the TR. And so we understand that um, there were people who could read the Greek, they could read the Latin and they could read the Hebrew. And so perhaps the disciples were schooled in Greek. I, I don't think that they were reading it LXX or anything like that. But um, Peter, at the, the worst case scenario is Peter was still speaking Hebrew at, a, at an older age and he just dictated this to someone who was fluent in Hebrew and in Greek and he just wrote it down in Greek. There's no problem with that. And I think a lot of what Jesus said was you know, spoken in Aramaic and that was sufficiently translated over into Greek and there's no problem with that. And so um, I, I don't see it's a huge issue for uh, maybe a draft um, copy. There was a draft copy of Matthew that um, was apparently still around. Um, who said it was there? I think it was it even was Jerome. Jerome. Jerome, yep. So he said that it was around um, and people were still reading it in certain areas and he wanted to look at it. I think he might have even looked at it at one stage. But yeah, he um, went, um, it wasn't our canonical Matthew because they had a couple of stories that are not in our Matthew. So it was a different edition, but it was at the library in Caesarea and uh, he looked at it. Yeah, he read it at one point. By the way, let me let me just switch gears for a minute before I pack it in for the night. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff on the Heavenly Witnesses on the Calm Forum. I've been using their questions to tighten up uh, certain things and make, uh, if you'll see the, my last couple of pages in um, PBF, include things like uh, John Wesley and how he's, spoke about Trinity and persons not being necessary and how could the heaven, the, the Father, Word, and Holy Ghost uh, all be in heaven and things like that. Can you get over to the right side where they, no, go to the top, go to the, go to the home, go home and you'll see the last, and then on the right side, you'll see the, see if you can uh, pull it over to see the right side. Uh, it'll show the most recent, maybe you're in forums. You might have to go to home rather than forums. Home on the top uh, there, up and over, up to the up and to the left. Home, okay. You see, home, uh, go home, and then no, I don't. Uh, are you all the way over on the right? Okay, uh, hit the home, not the forums. Hit the home, yeah, yeah, it just, yeah, it it just defaults, defaults to forums. forums. Oh, okay. And is there more on the right? Or maybe, maybe because you're not a member yet at this time, you might have to sign in. Uh, maybe. Okay. All right. Don't worry about it. Okay. Other week, this is good. Oh, look at that one. The witness of God is greater. Uh, no, don't go into that. I just was looking at the titles of them. Go back. Okay. You see 
How do the Father, Word, and Holy Ghost bear record? Somebody's really uh, testing me on that one. And also the fact that First John, etc. Okay. Uh, then it's the older stuff. Now we're back to the older stuff. And we're also going into stuff like uh, invisible. The thing that really gets them very uh, flustered is my phrase invisible allegory. Who are you to make up phrases? But um, uh, Henry Thomas Armstrong said, how could he have written, Not you know, he has a great quote about how Cyprian could not have done he could not have been speaking about one thing when he wrote about another. You know what I mean? He wrote uh, of, of this Father, Son, and Holy Holy Spirit, and it says these three are one. So they say that he was allegorizing, okay? they were, He was making an allegory of, of spirit, water, and blood. But if that was the case, anybody who looked at the Bible would say, Cyprian, you're a fool. It doesn't say that about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It says it about the... Spirit, water, and blood. What type of idiot are you? You know? So the, I call that invisible allegory. And I have a page on invisible allegory. And I just added a little bit to it. If you put search into invisible, you, or you might find it down here. Yeah. Um, oh, there's that Simonides handwriting. That, um, that's another thing, too. That we, you know, I want, uh, did you see, like, the big question mark is that handwriting that you put up, I'm switching gears for a minute. That handwriting that scribbled from the top of Isaiah, uh, I don't know what the experts say, whether that was supposed to be 300 AD. Yeah, uh, that's the one you put up. Remember that? Okay? Yeah. You yeah. put that up at TRA. And these are some other scribbles. This is a scribble from Simonides' personal handwriting. Uh, so the question is, is the one that you put up, is it really any possibility that anybody... Other write like that in the fourth century? Probably not. It's probably an 1800s writing, you know? But yeah, would any. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, not so much definitely. I mean, it's something that a, a true paleographer would look at. He might say, oh, no, I did find it in something. Here we go. Let's stay, stick with that. You were wondering about the ligatures and everything. You didn't get a lot of response. But, you know, I don't think you'll find. Now, of course, they'll change their theory. They'll say, of course, it was, it was done in the 400 AD because it's in Sinaiticus. So they use circular reasoning, the the, the pale, uh, paleographers, you see. But probably there's nothing remotely like that until the 17, 1800s. And this was Simonides' handwriting, and this is the page. And uh, again, it's this sort of big, bold, loopy stuff, but it's not as crazy as the other. So I thought that was interesting, too. Um, that I got from the Gwalior Library in New York, and where they have some of Simonides' uh, correspondence with people, etc. So, yeah, I think those are the same. Those second and third one, I think, are the same. Okay, I just want to let you know. A lot of interesting things. Listen, if you want to come back on the... We were talking about you a little bit, about Revelation 16, 5, but, you know, if you want to look at uh, Calm... Or you could just look. I try to get the best stuff pulled over here so it doesn't have all the fluff and puff. But there's a lot of interesting stuff being added uh, to the thing. Now, you know, um, there are guys, there are two guys who are contras, who are sort of, I mean, they're really wa wacky. You know, oh, I see the word mystery. What does the word mystery mean? Oh, it's got to be, it's got to be an allegory, blah, blah, blah. They just give, give me a headache. But there's two guys like that. And uh, they, they go nowhere. But th in the midst of all that, we've got a lot of good stuff going on. So I'll try to bring it over to PBF like I did over there. You saw a little bit of it. That's all, you know. Okay. Bless you. In Jesus' name, I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> Hey, thanks okay. for joining us, Stephen. Hey, thanks for joining us, Stephen. Okay, good talking. Listen, again, I'm still going to go over those two hours, and I'll probably point out some things. But who was here last week? The same couple of people, Christian, Helge, a couple of, any others? Uh, when you did the uh, thing with the um, heavenly witness? Yeah, Christian, yeah, turned, Christian up. turned up. I'll just mute I'll you just there for a sec.
um, Christian turned up and um, also Jeff Riddle turned up, um, a few other guys, but um, no one really interacted that much. I was just sort of, I, I just sort of talked for maybe three hours and then, then wrapped it up. Well, let me, let me give you a suggestion. You know, you might want to reduce it, actually. Also, you might want to have certain segments. Like maybe we could have a 15-minute segment or half, 15 to a half hour on the grammatical argument or grammatical and internal, one of the, either one. Because people do not really understand how beautiful that is. You know, it's not a proof because, you know, there are wiggle room for people. Uh, but it's a extremely strong evidence that, and especially just the idea that a Latin interpolation fixed to Greek is really beyond the pale. You know, it just uh, it's it's beyond any lie. So you can sort of try to imbue this in people, because I'll tell you something: very few people have argued the grammatical argument cogently. This is what upsets the people on calm is that I, I can argue it cogently. I take from Babionitis and I take from Eugenius. You know where Eugenius was very strong? He made it crystal clear that it's only neuter grammar with masculine nouns. So that when they give those reverse analogy, it's completely ridiculous, a blunder. And Babionitis is better in terms of explaining the syntactic parallelism. It'd be interesting to see. I was trying to find it, might be in some Greek books, but they won't say specifically that this will modify the grammar, but they'll explain what it is. So I try to take from those two. Nolan is not as good, and Dabney, and, and the modern people, they all get tripped up in uh, Bengal. They all get tripped up in various ways, every one of them. Uh, some are better than others. The guy from England, um, Ben, Sna uh, Ben uh, something, who wrote in 1983, he was pretty good. And I have a place where I have the English explanations of the grammatical argument. But, uh, but really, you've got to tailor it. You might want to work on it a little bit too. But uh, you've got to tailor it. You've got to take from the two super experts, Bulgaris and Babionidis, and then fill it in. I'll give you an example. Nolan made a big thing about figure attraction. And he might have technically been right, but you can't really support it that way. And he gave a bad analogy. He gave an analogy from John of the Paraclete verses. Doesn't it work? Okay. Anyway, maybe you might want to reduce the time so people don't get intimidated about a three-hour session. Just thinking, just, you know, suggesting. And you might want to uh, have half the time structured, uh, including I'll bring you back to the heavenly witnesses after I listen to your two hour, two hour, 40 minute session. But it's a little intimidating to go on this long for people. Just want to let you know, even me, who loves the topic and gets to speak. <laughs> okay? I'll, I'll, I'll move. Uh, yeah, yeah, cheers, Stephen. And so I guess um, one of the things is, um, some of the guys are watching from Norway, some of the guys from the UK, and you guys are in the US. And so um, I've, I've one of the reasons why I keep it long is so that everyone can get an opportunity to join in. And I think people, after a while, will feel comfortable in just jumping in and, and sharing their little bits. I, I do want to do some other things as well. Um, like I want to run debates on this forum and um, and also like like you're talking about doing things that are a little bit more you know, under a time constraint where we you know, we talk about something for you know, an hour and a half and that's it or an hour and that's it. And so um, but I think with with this session on at this time, I'm going to just run this um, run this out for as long because some people really do enjoy these long-winded okay, uh, videos. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. I understand. So. I understand. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm going to close up. I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> I'm going to get uh, – I have to be careful with my health, uh, get good rest and stuff.
um, I got hit with a, uh, some stuff I got to be careful with. Um, so I'm going to take some rest, but it was a great, I did enjoy it. It was great. And I appreciate the time. And, and I thank you, Helge. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Helge. Uh, I remember when you were on the textual forums back around uh, 2000, early 2000s, and you came in there and made some good comments, 2005, TC, TC list, places like that. So just so you know. And I do wonder, do you have a, you know, that in Norway, you've got that scholar, Ralph Faruli, the JW guy, who does some half decent work on Jehovah, but he also does some bad work too. <laughs> so, the, but I don't know many other Norwegians in the Bible area, but he's interesting. Okay, blessings in Jesus' name. I'll hang in. You can hang up with, you can finish up with Helge. And, uh, but I do, I did appreciate what you wrote 15 years ago. So it's good to see you again. Okay. And, 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 and say hi to all the fjords to me. Blessings in Jesus' name. Good night. Thanks, David. Okay. Um, so it's always interesting listening to Stephen. Um, and, you know, usually when um, Stephen talks, uh, the sparks fly between him and the confessional bibliologists. And um, I think it's good that people, you know, explain why. Um, and it was good that um, uh, Christian was saying, um, you know, about the Westminster Confession of Faith and things like that. That was that was good. Um, and so, yeah, I think what I'll do next week, I'll just continue on with this topic because we only really got to um, to around the time of Erasmus. And so what I'll do is I'll just start from there and we'll talk about Erasmus's uh, Texas Receptus editions. Um, and if anything else comes to light about the um, Complutensian, and we're just going to go from Erasmus all the way through to uh, the Elzevas, and so if you uh, want to say something, if you want to jump on, just like Stephen did, you just, um, you know, just jump on and with a webcam uh, and that's all cool. But um, I'm going to bail myself. So God bless you guys. Thanks for watching and um, I'll see you next time.